Okay. What is going on, everybody? Welcome to the awesome NBA Deeper Dive presented by No House Advantage. I am Dave Lockwood on the Twitters at Lafayette underscore D L O U G H Y underscore D. Do what's right. Give me a follow along with my man, Adam Share at Ship My Money DFS. What is going on, brother? Not much. Uh, I feel like this is the biggest Tuesday slate we've had in a while. Yeah, we're kind of lucky though. All week we're arranging like seven to eight or nine games. Nothing. Yeah, it's it's back to being. I don't know. I I like those slates. I hate when we do the eleven or twelve on Monday and then three on Tuesday and ten on Wednesday. Especially when it's when it's us. I almost feel like we do a better job of getting through bigger slates because we feel the urgency. Right? There's a sense of urgency when we have six, seven, eight games. We're like, oh, we got plenty of time. By the time you know it. Game five, five fifty-five, and yeah, we, we do things, you know, like talk at the top about how we do a better job of not wasting time on on, on bigger slates. Right to waste time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the strategy show with Josh Engelman and myself has been an adventure. If you missed today's show, just go back and watch it after the fact. Who cares if the slate is over? I promise you will enjoy it. But if you if you don't want to do that, Monday through Sunday, every single day of the week, 10 a.m. Eastern, I'm on with Josh now, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday, four of the five work week, work days. Uh, it's good stuff. We got stuff all day long. Josh's process show at 6.30 a.m., MLB strategy show, MLB live before lock, NBA live before lock coming up after this. Just so much here. There's no real reason to go anywhere else than the Awesome o YouTube channel. But the biggest thing is we're happy to have you guys with us. Smash that thumbs up button and hit the subscribe if you haven't done so yet. Here's how I see it. It takes around a fraction of a second. Well, we'll say a second to navigate to the thumbs up and do so. I promise you it will not take much away from your life, but it does a ton for us. And two seconds probably to hit the subscribe button along with the thumbs up button. So if you haven't done so, go ahead and do that. And, uh, you know, enjoy the show. If you like free content, we got you covered here. We got the best there is right on Awesome So uh, first question, as always, Adam, you know how it goes. This slate, eight games, uh, a couple really low projected totals, and then a few games later on with some high totals. We're still waiting on some news in Indiana. I, I think I have a pretty decent idea of how that breaks. New Orleans, we're waiting on Ingram and Zion and a couple of other spots that could be pretty significant. We already got the Van Vliet news earlier. How are you approaching this one? Is it anything like the wild stars and scrub slate that we saw last night where the 100K winner on DraftKings had Bembry? Uh, he had Bembry uh, and three other 4K or less players with Kyrie Irving, Julius Randle and Luka Doncic. So he managed to, to fit all of them in. Is that, a, is that something we might be able to do tonight? Right now, it doesn't seem that likely. Um, it, it seems to me like one of the more difficult slates right now as far as when I, I ran some lineups before the show, just, you know, crunching optimal lineups, basically. Um, it, it's the first time in a while where there's been one or two guys in my lineup where I'm just like, yeah, I, I guess, you know, I don't really like them, but there's nothing really better at that price. Obviously, that can definitely change. You know, like you said, we're waiting on Indiana news. We're waiting on Pelicans news. Um, there's probably going to be some other random stuff that happens that we're not expecting because there normally is. But right now, the way it's set up, it seems like the one of the more difficult slates we've had in a while as far as you might actually not like every single player in your lineup. And it's been a really long time, I think, since we've had a slate like that. Yeah, I would agree. Well, I guess it's time to jump into it. We got about an hour to make this work. Starting a few minutes early just to get everything in. Chicago and the Indiana Pacers, the Bulls are favored. Now, albeit only by a point, but I know you hate doing this. I'm not- Are we doing this again? I'm doing this again. I'm doing this again. (laughs) You know what? You're going to agree with me on this one. You don't want to, but you will. Is there any justifiable reason that at home, a healthy Sabonis and Brogdon on the floor and they're dogs to the bulls. I don't know. The betting public is assuming that they're going to sit like it opened at that. 
Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I think it's 50-50 that each of them play. Okay. All right. But it opened there, though. It didn't move there. We'll see. All right, 50-50. Fair enough. I think the fact is, well, let me, let me put it to you this way. If Brogdon and Sabonis do play, or if Sabonis plays, jump on that line as quick as you can before it goes off the board. You would agree with that? Yeah. Yeah. So keep an eye out for that. Make sure you got your alerts, your news got alerts, or wherever you get them from in order to make that happen. So we'll start it off with the Bulls then. We got a healthy Zach Levine. We are still waiting on Kobe White, but he's probable. Not that that really makes any difference at all at this point. Do you like Levine today? Are you on guys like, uh, so, uh, sorry, Laurie Markkinen or Patrick Williams, some of the cheaper options here on DraftKings? Yeah, I think the Bulls actually look more appealing tonight than they have in a while because uh, no Daniel Tice, so that opens up some minutes. And then the matchup against the Pacers really isn't that bad either. They've been one of the faster teams over the last month, middle of the pack in terms of, of defensive efficiency, but also some pretty good pricing here. You know, you mentioned Zach Levine, and he's only averaged 0.9 fantasy points per minute in the four games he's played with Vooch, but he's got a 32% usage rate over those games. He hasn't shot well, but that's not something that you expect to, to hold long term. His assist percentage in those games is only about 15% compared to 23% for the season. But if you look at his potential assists per 36 minutes, he's averaging less than one fewer potential assist per 36 minutes. So um, as the sample size increases, if he keeps getting those opportunities, I think you see the assist percentage increase as well. And his salary is dropping. You know, he's 7,200 on FanDuel, which looks great. 7,800 on DraftKings, I think, uh, still offers plenty of upside as well. It's especially because the shooting guard position tonight is pretty difficult to fill out with guys that you like. So um, at the very least, I like Levine a lot in tournaments. Uh, I think a little bit more difficult to get to in cash games. Vooch, I think, looks pretty good. His per-minute production has been similar in Chicago as it was in Orlando. Not playing as many minutes, only played about 32 and a half last game, which was a competitive game. But you could see him get a couple more with Tice out as well. And then Thaddeus Young, I think, is kind of scary because he doesn't typically play as many minutes as a lot of guys priced around him, but he's been really productive this year with about one and a quarter fantasy points per minute, both in games that he started and in the games that he's played since Vooch joined the team with Tice out. I think you probably get a couple more minutes there. He's averaged about 25 minutes per game. I would guess you get, you know, somewhere around 28 uh, from, from young, which makes him look like a, a viable option too. So I think Levine, Vooch and young all look pretty good. You can certainly make a case for taking some shots at guys like Sadoransky or at Lori Markkinen who could benefit from Tice being out as well but i think that the the main three uh vooch levine and young are the guys that i'm most interested in and uh the question in chat yeah if you have the awesome avatar it is to get a free month of awesome plus right everything on the site to get a free month it's pretty cool make sure you have the avatar whether it's draft kings fandle wherever it is make sure you have that and finish top three in a contest of five thousand or more people Okay, that's all you got to do. Make sure to screenshot us, uh, uh, screenshot it, include me in it, uh, and include Awesome Hall of Fame and Awesome and all that stuff, and we'll get you squared away and we'll give you a shout out on the show. I've been thinking long and hard about how we're going to do the Hall of Fame segment. Took some time, kind of kicked it down the road. We're going to do it in the strategy show. So if you have a big win and you, and you screenshot us and you're looking for that shout out, when Josh and I are on the strategy show, we're going to do a really, really awesome segment uh, with all of the winners with the Awesome logo because, uh, well, we love you guys. So it's pretty cool stuff. And it's not bad for us either, you know. <laughs> all right. So uh, do you want to talk about the Pacers and just what you're seeing here? Because I, I know it's a lot of uncertainty but it is the only seven o'clock lock. So that's good. We have time on our side in this case. We should know. Uh, well, we will know. Right should, now, should know. What's up? Should know. We, yeah, I guess you're right. <laughs> it's not Minnesota, at least, where doubtful means active. and Yeah, yeah and it, it's not the Clippers where in the starting lineup means out. <laughs> yeah. But uh, so right now, do you have Sabonis out or in? I have them both in for right now. Ooh. But again, you know, like you said, it's the first game on the slate. So. Uh, don't have to spend too much time trying to guess. Okay. So then let's talk about it with, uh, with let, let's go back and forth with them in and out. I think it only makes sense. Right. And then live before lock should have this news as it breaks and they'll be able to give you the evaluation and, and analyze whatever needs to be done. What are you doing with Sabonis? If he plays, like, do you have any interest in him against Chicago? Yeah, some. Um, but I think the problem for Sabonis is there's a couple of very strong power forward options tonight, uh, namely Giannis and Pascal Siakam. So I, I think it will kind of push Sabonis to like a secondary option, but he, you know, obviously has a really high ceiling. If he's in and he's not limited, it would definitely be a guy that makes sense in tournaments because he's almost definitely going to be lower owned than Siakam at a similar price point. Um, same kind of for, for Brogdon. Like if Sabonis and Brogdon are both in, I think Brogdon's okay. He's 
fairly priced. He's 6,800 on drafting, 6,700 on FanDuel. He's averaged a little over a fantasy point per minute since Karis LeVert joined the team. Um, he, he's okay, especially if like other value doesn't open up elsewhere. But I still think he'd be more of a secondary option. Um, where it gets a little more interesting is if Sabonis is in and Brogdon is out, or Brogdon is in and Sabonis is out, then obviously you're seeing a bump for Sabonis. If he's the one that's in, you're seeing a bump for Brogdon. If he's the one that, that's in, that would make them look a little bit better, especially Brogdon, because I think that the mid-range guards on this slate are actually lacking, which is something that is pretty unusual. But there's some guards that, that I want to pay up for. But as far as the mid-range guys, there's not a whole lot I feel good about. So if you got Brogdon in and Sabonis out, I think he would kind of move to the front of the point guard position. Do you have Brogdon in, I'm assuming, as well? Yeah. Yeah. So I guess the easier way to put this right now would be if – both of these guys are active. Are there any priorities for Indiana? If they're both active, I don't really think any of them are priorities. Like Sabonis is fine in tournaments. Brogdon's fine in tournaments, but none of them would jump out. Um, where, where you get priorities, I think, is if Sabonis sits, it bumps Turner, it bumps Brogdon. If they both sit, you get Karis LeVert at a pretty weak shooting guard position where um, you know he's going to be like the entire offense, basically. So he would look a lot better. You could certainly look to TJ McConnell, who probably plays around 30 minutes. Um, and average the fantasy point per minute if, uh, you know, Brogdon's out. But if they're both in, it's really tough, I think, to, to prioritize anything here, especially because the other thing is that this is the only 7 o'clock game. And even though we're not waiting on a ton of late news, there is um, a huge piece of news in Denver with Jamal Murray. You do have the Pelicans news, which I assume we'll have before, before 7 o'clock. But, you know, this time of year, we're just getting all sorts of, of late news that we don't expect either. So um, going to guys that don't look that great in the first game is always kind of – carry some extra risk because it limits your, your flexibility as news breaks. Right. Settling on someone in those games isn't going to help, but it's, it's not to say you should be avoiding great plays in early games uh, if they're great plays, but yeah. maybe, maybe a tiebreaker on secondary or just like last man in type of situations would be a guy later in a game with on a slate that has significant pending news like this. Yeah. I think that's the way to put it. Like it's, it's a tiebreaker. Like one of the, I made a big mistake in cash. I thought the other day because I don't remember who the players even were, but it was a slate kind of like this where you had one early game. I had two lineups that projected almost identical. I felt basically the same about both lineups. And I ended up going with the one that had a guy in the early game, a bunch of news broke, including some stuff that wasn't even like on the radar. And I'm just sitting there with, you know, two guys locked that I can't, you know, use their roster spots. Would you say Karis Levert becomes a significantly better option and that you would really like him at a 7K plus price point? if Sabonis or Brogdon or maybe even both of them are out? Yeah, I think so, especially because the shooting guard position's uh, pretty weak tonight. So I, I think Levert would look really good. Um, So far, he's played – he's only played 64 minutes since he joined the Pacers without Brogdon or Sabonis, but he's got a 24.5% usage rate, 25% assist percentage. And we know from his time with the Nets that when he was playing without Kyrie, when he was playing without Spencer Dinwiddie, uh, you know, with the Nets, he was producing at a very high rate. So he's someone that may not be the most efficient player, may, you know, turn the ball over some, may make some, some boneheaded plays. But from a fantasy standpoint, when he is the focal point of the offense, he typically comes through. Yeah, I think so, too. What would the rest of this offense look like if those guys sit? Because TJ McConnell, I was thinking this the other day. I'm watching, I'm watching the overtime period between – Indiana and the Spurs, right? Pacers end up taking the W, 139-133. And TJ McConnell might be one of the most underappreciated bench players in the league. Might sound weird, right? But he never makes mistakes, Adam. He never turns the ball over, at least very rarely. Of course, sometimes he turns the ball over, but not, not, as much, not in clutch or key situations. And he makes smart plays, and he's got this weird baseline play or weird play where he'll sneak through the across the baseline under the basket, turnaround jumper that never misses. Anyway, he's a pretty decent player. If Brogdon sits, you're gonna get probably more holiday in the starting lineup. But McConnell feels like the actual upside option here that has solid, solid upside just from an overall peripheral standpoint if he plays another 30-plus minutes, which we've seen in back-to-back -back games. Is it worth it, or is he a little bit too costly? Yeah, no, I think he looks good if Brogdon's out. Um, you know, unfortunately, they've been starting Edmund Sumner instead of McConnell. Like, earlier this year, you got one or two games that McConnell started and just played like 40 plus minutes without Brogdon. That hasn't been the case, but still, he's about a fantasy point per minute guy. And like you said, he just gets it done in a variety of ways. Like outside of stars, he's probably one of my least favorite guys in DFS where like a, a team is 
is gaining on me and they have McConnell and I need McConnell not to do well because it just seems like, you know, he somehow manages to get there every single time he gets a chance, whether it's assists, whether it's efficient shooting, you know, steals, whatever, he typically gets it done. So at 5,300, you know, even if he comes off the bench, I'm assuming you're getting around 30 minutes from him and it would be a pretty good price tag, especially again, if, if more or better guard value doesn't open up, there's not a whole lot. Like when I was crunching draft things on it before the show, um, you're getting to like some Marcus Smart, you're getting to some Grayson Allen, like guys that that are fine at their price points, but that you're not really excited about. So it's not like you have to have, you know, a 45 point game for McConnell most likely at that price to be a, a good play on the slate. Right. Absolutely. I guess it just comes down to the same point you made of a couple of minutes ago. It's like on the early slate with the only game locking at seven, does this TJ McConnell make sense? But yeah, I, I think with Brogdon out, he's a perfectly reasonable play. Would you go to anybody else here on the Pacers in the event that one or the both of these guys sits? Um, I briefly mentioned Miles Turner, but his rates bump, uh, get a nice bump if Sabonis is out. I think that the center position today is kind of tough because, you know, you have Jokic at the top, which is obviously really nice. Um, but there's a lot of mid-range options that are probably a little bit overpriced for their average uh, production, but that offer really high ceilings. I think Turner would uh, fit in as a pretty nice play if Sabonis ruled out. All right, let's talk about this next one then, New Orleans and Atlanta. Obviously, a ton of pending news here. Zion is questionable. Ingram is questionable. Uh, Carol Lewis Jr. is doubtful. Josh Hart and Akil Alexander-Walker are out. Steven Adams was in the concussion protocol, but it looks like he's good to go. So, Really, really big uh, implications here. If Zion and Ingram or even one of them ends up sitting, you're already down two pretty key go uh, rotational guards in, in Alexander Walker and Josh Hart. Could be without Lewis as well. It's kind of a mess for the New Orleans Pelicans right now and a tough one to break down. Yeah, it is. You know, obviously this is one of the games that we're, we're, we are waiting on huge news here because, you know, if Zion and Ingram are both in, then it's going to take minutes and usage and production and everything away from um, everyone else. And it's going to make them overall, the team, you know, less appealing in uh, DFS. But if those guys are out, I mean, Lonzo Ball came back last game, played 37 minutes. I would assume you're getting you know, tons of minutes from him again and increased opportunities as well. He scored 27 points last game. You're going to get a ton of run from James Johnson. Jackson Hayes started alongside uh, Steven Adams and played 29 minutes last game. Um, Bledsoe, you know, takes on a bigger role as well if those guys are out. And all these guys have to play huge minutes, you know, if, if uh, Ingram and Zion are out. Because, like you said, you're down Alexander Walker and you're down Josh Hart. Yeah, exactly. And that that's going to make things difficult. Live Before Lock will have more on that. Chris Baggs and Eric Lindquist taking you up till 7. But if we're breaking it down right now, the simplest way for me to put it would be if Zion and Ingram are both in, is there anything you're looking towards on the Pelicans in the front court or in the back court? Um, not really. Like I wouldn't talk anyone off of Zion or Ingram, but overall I think that the Pelicans would mostly be overpriced because they've been without those guys for several games now. So whereas Eric Bledsoe, you know, was at 4,400, now he's 6,100 on draft teams. Lonzo is at 7,500. Like you can still make a case for Zion at 8,900 or Ingram at 81, but uh, neither of those are, are super appealing, especially against the slow Atlanta team. And then obviously if those guys are in, it's knocking James Johnson down. You're not going to get Hayes starting alongside Adams. Um, you know, Najee Marshall doesn't end up being a thing. So if they're in, there's nothing that I would prioritize here. Uh, one other thing to mention too, um, you know, we were talking about the backcourt being depleted. They do have Isaiah Thomas here, but – I think that's, it's not a huge deal. It's just that, you know, he can at least replace some of those minutes that you're losing from Kira Lewis and Alexander Walker. All right. So any, is there anything else you want to get to for the Pelicans here, just because it's such a mess of a situation or do we just need to wait? Yeah. I mean, I think all you can really do is wait. Like we, we've had enough games now where Zion and Ingram are out that we, we kind of know what to expect. Like Zion and, or Ball and Bledsoe will play huge minutes. They'll both be good options. They are even more expensive though. You could get Hayes starting, in which case at 4,100, he would have some value. Uh, James Johnson's played extremely well. I think he'd still be a good value even at 5,200. But, you know, again, it's you're waiting on so much because not e with it being two players too, you're not even just saying, well, what if, you know, in or out? Like one can be in, one can be out, in which case everything becomes really messy uh, in that case as well. So with the Falcons, the Falcons, I'm so <laughs> bad at mixing up names for teams that, it, you know, I got the city right and the sport wrong. For the Atlanta Hawks, they, we know at least what's going on here, unless we get any news, uh, barring any unforeseen news. You have John Collins, you have DeAndre Hunter out, and then Reddish, no timetable whatsoever. With Collins out, 
Clint Capella is someone that has played really well. And even on the season, his permanent production has been spectacular. Is, is he a guy that we go to today? Do we pay a, a mid to upper 8K price point against this Pelicans front court? Or is there just better, are there, sorry, better options to go to in this higher pricing tier? I'm definitely interested in tournaments. I think that it's kind of hard to prioritize that salary uh, in cash games, especially, I mean, on FanDuel is 9,900. That makes it really, really tough. 8,600, I think, is a little bit more palatable on DraftKings. Like, the Pelicans are a pretty weak team defensively. Um, Steven Adams individually is is fine, but Capella has been very productive this year. 1.37 DraftKings points per minute overall, and he's played more minutes since John Collins was injured. Um, he's averaging about 32 minutes per game uh, when you account for the fact that one of the three games went to double overtime and he played 44 minutes. I, I would expect you're getting 32 to 34 minutes if this game's competitive and he's not in foul trouble at close to 1.4 fantasy points per minute. He still has a really, really high ceiling. He, he's one of those centers that I was talking about when I mentioned Miles Turner, that there's guys that are maybe a little bit overpriced for their their medium projection, but that still give you, you know, a, a massive ceiling. And I think that, like on DraftKings, for example, we have Capella projected for about 8% ownership. We have Vooch projected for 19% ownership. I think Vooch is the better play, like in, in, in cash, for example, but I don't think he's beating Clint Capella, you know, three times to one. Do you like anything else from Atlanta, whether it be Trey Young or Bogdanovich, whose price has come up after a few solid games? I like Trey Young. I think that like he's coming off coming off of an absolutely awful game against Golden State. He had, I think, 18 and a half DraftKings points, only played 28 minutes, didn't even close that game. Um, but you know, I, I assume that's just an anomaly. Like, I don't think we're gonna start seeing Trey Young regularly play 28 minutes a night. Um, I don't think we're gonna see him regularly play terrible and did you really, think, did you find any particular reason for that in a game that they won by six points i think he was just playing really bad wow okay because like That's... down the stretch he was kind of in and out like he uh subbed in with four and a half minutes to go in the fourth subbed out with three minutes to go came back in for eight seconds went back to the bench like i i think they just wanted they closed with lou williams basically um well, that, that's the thing like with lou williams here who played 26 minutes it's hard to imagine that, you know, despite his track record at the NBA level, that Lou Williams is going to take enough playing time away from Trey Young. But it would be a little bit uh, discouraging if a bad game resulted in Lou Williams getting more playing time than Trey Young now that there's actually a, a serviceable backup behind them. Yeah, I think Williams being there makes Young riskier because, like, if you remember when they traded Rondo, but Williams hadn't uh, come in yet, you were getting these 37, 30 you know, 36, 37 minute games from Trey Young. I think we go back to getting 33 or 34 minutes more often than not, which obviously isn't as good. And when you have someone like Lou Williams behind them, the leash is probably a little bit shorter, but it's not like Williams is only playing minutes without Young on the floor. They're playing alongside each other as well. So I think more often than not, you're getting those 33 or 34 minutes from Young and he is priced down. He's down to 8,500 on FanDuel, 9,100 on DraftKings. One thing that I think is at least worth mentioning but again i don't you know it, it's one it's one thing to keep in mind the pelicans have um been pretty good this year at not allowing pick and roll possessions so i think there is some chance that they look to get the ball out of young's hands force guys like bogdanovich and herder on the wings to beat them um that's certainly a risk but again when you're talking about a pretty low owned trey young at a cheap price tag I know that he's risky in general, but I'm just kind of playing for for the ceiling. And as long as the um, ownership stays low, I do have interest in Young here. Chat, by the way, says that he was holding his wrist on the bench. So that actually could have a lot to do with it. Brogdon out, Sabonis out, Liam in. Yeah, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, come on. Plus one at home at Banker's Life Fieldhouse. Used to be called that. I don't know what it's still called. Maybe you Indiana people can tell me if I still got it down. But uh, yeah, there you go. Okay, so Brogdon and Sabonis out. Trey Young apparently hurt his wrist or his hand. Good look into that for sure, but who knows? And apparently Lou Williams was just crushing in the fourth quarter. Do you have any other interest in Atlanta here? Because this game has a, a, a high total. It's, it's, all, it's a 230 and a half total. You know you're going to see a lot of points here, but it feels weird seeing some of the prices. And even though there's a high total and it should be a competitive game, price tag and the rest of the field is pretty much going to determine any moves that we make tonight. Yeah. Pricing's just up on these guys. I think if I had to go to anywhere from Atlanta outside of young and Capella, I think I would look to Lou Williams just because he's 5,300 on, on DK 5k on FanDuel. That's still a price point where, you know, if he does get 25, 26 minutes, you know, you can get 35 points out of, uh, you know, 35 fantasy points out of Williams, but you know, again, it would just be a secondary option here. 
especially okay. as we've just gotten more value from the Indiana team. Let's just revisit this really quickly since we're fine. With the Pacers, now that both of these guys are out, who are your top options here? I like McConnell at 5,300. I like Turner at 6,200, and I like LaVert at 7,200. What about Doug McDermott? He's fine. Um, you're expecting that he plays around 30 minutes. Uh, he's not you know, the most exciting player, but – he is 4,100 on DraftKings. He's more of like a last guy in type for me. Yeah. Um, you know, if, if I'm building my cash lineup or building a lineup in general and I need a $4,100 forward, I'm not going to shy away from McDermott, but I'm not really seeking him out either. I had some Doug McDermott the other day and he started like seven minutes in. He had 13 or 14 fantasy points and he finished with 16 fantasy points. Yeah. So that's what you can get from him. Jer- and- Jeremy Lamb being back. Jeremy Lamb's kind of interesting in larger field tournaments. Um, he's only 3,400 on draft days. I think that there's a good chance you only get 16 to 18 minutes from him, but if he plays well, he could certainly play more. Like he can take minutes from Sumner. He can take minutes from Aaron holiday. He can take minutes from McDermott. He can take minutes from Justin holiday. He can, if he's playing well, he can take minutes from so many guys that I think 3,400, he has a pretty high ceiling. I'm looking forward to see what Levert's ownership comes in at because a low on Levert could make for a very, very good play today. I don't, but I don't think he ends up being low owned because we got that news so early. I was thinking, I was thinking it's not crazy though, maybe 20% or so. You think above 7K, Levert's going to be uber chalk? I mean, 20% probably is yeah. reasonable. I shouldn't have said low on, but not insane, you know, 40% ownership. Yeah, I don't think it'll be crazy because I mean, you also still have, uh, you know, you have Levine at a pretty cheap price point. You have Paul George, especially on drafting. Right. Price. You have uh, CJ McCollum. I mean, there's there's a number of shooting guards in that range that are still going to project similarly enough to LeVert. Let's talk about Embiid and the Sixers. They're two-point favorites against the Celtics in Boston, 221 total. Joel Embiid came back on Saturday, sat out the second of a back-to-back against Memphis. They got their dicks kicked in. It was an embarrassing game. And now he's back here on Tuesday night against the Seas in a game where they're very much going to require his services much looking forward to this matchup between him and um, and, and I always want to call him Robin Williams, Robert, <laughs> Robert Williams. It should be a fun one because Williams has played great, but he hasn't faced a good center in any of these games since he's actually started playing really well. So here's a true test. What do you think about Jojo today? And do you think he gets, cause I'm giving him around 32, 33 minutes. I'm not sure he gets a ton more than that. Just judging by doc rivers words, which might mean nothing. Yeah, that's kind of where I'm at as well. He only played about 28 and a half minutes last game, or yeah, the last game he played, then he sat on the second half of the back-to-back. So I don't feel very confident that he plays big minutes here, but at his current ownership, I do think that he's pretty interesting because there's not a lot of payoff options on this slate. You know, above 10K, you basically, I think you only have Giannis, you have um, Embiid, and you have Jokic. So, and anybody paying off a center is going to go to, or most people paying off a center are going to go to Jokic. Right now, we only have Embiid projected for 2% ownership on DraftKings. I think that makes him appealing in tournaments just because we don't know how many minutes he's going to play. You know, my best guess is like 30 to 32, but I certainly could be wrong. Doc Rivers certainly could play in more minutes, especially if this game's competitive. Um, so, And we know he produces at a really high rate. He's been great this year. So I think that Embiid still has a really high ceiling. I just think that his medium projection is a little bit lower than it would be had he, you know, played 34 minutes last game or something. Um, the, the range of outcomes is a little bit wider, but if he's going to be 2% home, that's a pretty good play in tournaments, I think. Yeah, I think so, too, because he's just a monster permanent producer and people worry about his minutes. But we've seen it so many times in the past, Adam, where Joel Embiid, everyone gets away from him because they're like, hey, there's no way he plays more than 28, 30 minutes. And then it ends up being a close game. He's perfectly fine. And he plays 37, 38 minutes. We've seen that a lot. So do I think it's risky? Is it a cash game play? No, it's risky, of course. But in large field tournaments or even even smaller field tournaments or three maxes, when you're talking about an Embiid pre, uh, ownership right now that is around 2.8% on DraftKings, that seems, and I'm sure we'll, we'll have an updated run very shortly, that seems really low for some, oh, wait, we just got one. What's he at? 3.2%, Adam. It just seems very low for someone of his caliber. As yeah, and the other thing, too, is, like, I, I really like Giannis tonight. I, I like Jokic a lot. But this isn't one of those slates where you have Harden without um, Kyrie or, or Westbrook without Beal. Like none of these top end guys have anything like extra pushing them, you know, even higher. 
they're they're obviously very good plays, and I in a vacuum would like them more than Embiid. But you, it, it's just so if he gets close to normal minutes, it's just so easy to see how he ends up being the highest scorer out of that group because there's not that many that he would have to beat, and because none of them have at least right now, like Jamal Murray could end up being out. But right now, um, none of them have, you know, Middleton sitting or Murray sitting or something like that. So um, I, I think the ownership for tournaments is, is really um, appealing right now. Indeed. How about the rest of the Sixers and Ben Simmons, who's just been atrocious lately? I mean, there's just no words. <laughs> Actually, no, I have, I have plenty of words, but I can't say them right now. Tobias Harris has been the Sixers closer recently which is pretty insane he's he's a lot streaker though than I think people would like to give him credit for when his price gets up into the mid 8k range especially with Joel Embiid back I take a step back maybe you have some different opinions on the Sixers today floor is yours I don't um it's okay. just you know it's it's kind of like we talked about with the Pelicans you know Simmons and Harris are at price points that are still kind of appealing if Embiid were out. But when you bring Embiid back, um, the production just, you know, kind of falls off, especially for Harris, who ends up not being the third option offensively, but he loses some rebounding. He loses some assists. He loses, you know, a good amount of usage. It just becomes really difficult um, to see Simmons or, or Harris having success at their prices. I think so, too. The rest of them, from the Danny Greens to the... Seth Curry's and such are those just guys that you want nothing to do with either yeah I don't I don't really see it all right me neither now Boston gets a little interesting if Robert Williams can keep himself out of foul trouble sure you can't predict foul trouble and and bake that into your projections but if it happened against Joel Embiid none of us would even be surprised a little bit so I guess we'll see he's not he's not necessarily someone that gets into a, a massive amount of foul trouble but this is a very difficult spot that he's going to be up against both defensively and on offense against Joel Embiid defense down low. How do you read the the Robert Williams play today? I've been waiting to ask you this question because it's really the first center that he's played that is a versatile two-way center in Embiid who can kill you offensively from anywhere on the floor and also make your life a living hell on defense. Yeah, I think it's one of the more interesting spots on the slate. And typically in situations like this, the first thing I look to is ownership. You know, I, I think in a lot of cases – Ownership sort of gets overstated at this point because it's kind of like the cool thing to talk about and it sounds good, but this is the kind of situation where it does really matter because you have a very wide range of outcomes on someone like Robert Williams. One, because of the way that he plays. Um, you know, he, he's a very volatile player. He produces at a high rate, but a lot of that comes from blocks. He's a relatively low usage guy and the playing time can, can kind of fluctuate. But then also, like you said, this is his first really tough uh, matchup as a starter. You know, you're going up against not only a high usage guy in Embiid that does increase the risk of fouls, but also a very good defender in Embiid and a very good rebounder. So he can just make life difficult in general for Robert Williams to where he produces at a lower than average rate. But right now on DraftKings, we only have him projected for about 14% ownership. Um, Alex's Sims have him with a 20% chance of being in the optimal lineup. So he looks like one of the more under owned guys right now based on ownership projection. And even when I crunched, um, some optimal lineups before the show, which obviously those have changed now with the Pacers news, but Robert Williams was getting in a decent amount of them. And I was, I, I thought um, I was going to kind of having to make a tough decision for cash because I think his floor is pretty low. I think it's a very risky spot, but he's also got one of the highest ceilings out of guys in his price range. So I think that a lot really does just come down to where his ownership ends up projected at because um, he's certainly got slate winning upside at, at his salary. And he also has the ability to just absolutely nuke your lineup, um, you know, because his floor is, is very low in this spot. So um, right now with his ownership where it is, I think he looks like a very good play. I do too. I'm excited for this matchup for sure. Now the rest of this Boston team, you're going to have to pay for guys like Tatum, Jalen Brown's a mid-range price point where we've seen him most of the year. Kemba Walker. Evan Fournier's out, by the way, and Tristan Thompson is yet to return as well. So just so you have that information, I don't think the Fournier news is all that important, but he's another body that won't be on the floor. And Marcus Smart's been back for a little while now, so they're mostly healthy. Can you get to these guys uh, outside of Robert Williams? I think Brown and Smart are the two that are going to be easiest to get to from a roster construction standpoint outside of Williams. I don't love either one. I mean, Philadelphia, we know, is a very good defensive team, and they got Embiid back, which makes the defense even better. But small forwards pretty weak today, and then on DraftKings, um, he's shooting guard eligible as well. So you can roster Jalen Brown at five out of eight spots on DraftKings, which is pretty nice. He's averaged 1.13 DraftKings points per minute with Kemba and with Tatum active this year. Fournier being out is one less mouth to feed. And then Marcus Smart, around 0.9 fantasy points per minute 
assuming he's going to play around 34 minutes here. Again, not really one of those guys that you feel really good about getting to, but he kind of just helps your lineups fit together. So I can see getting to either of those guys. Wouldn't be that excited about it, but, you know, they're both fine. And then, you know, obviously we, we talked a lot about Williams. 200 likes and 1,800 people watching. This will bring shame to my family name if they ever find out about this. Please, please, don't do me like that. Don't make me bang. All I ask for is a solid five to 800 likes within the next 30 minutes. It's appreciated, though, guys. It really does help us with the algorithm and get people on the site. So if you like the show uh, and if you like all of the free content and you think we do a good job, maybe the best job out there, show some simple support. Hit that thumbs up and subscribe. And uh, we thank you for that. Let's talk about the Lakers and the Toronto Raptors. But before we do, you guys know the MLB promo going on right now. And if you don't, I'm going to tell you because it's awesome. We just had a couple of people uh, tweet us earlier today and last night who used the promo and had nice little wins uh, over, over there and already recouped all of that and a whole lot more. The starting nine promo, S-T-A-R-T-I-N-G, number nine, all one word, gets you nine days for $9. That's everything on the site for baseball player projections, ownership projections, the extremely essential top stack tool, all of these created by Alex Baker himself. You might know him as awesome. Maybe you know him as the number one ranked DFS player out there. He's won a ton of money playing DFS, specifically baseball, using these exact tools that we're offering. Uh, they're awesome. All the tools, the top pitchers tools, so much more, the lineup builder. And we have tutorials for all this stuff. Maybe you're, maybe you're a little bit uh, nervous or, or unsure saying, listen, I'm new to this. I just stumbled upon the site. I just got into DFS. All of these tools are overwhelming. I, I don't know how to use this. We got you covered. We also have the premium Slack chat with a great community that can help you out and premium office hours where the pros at Awesome answer your questions. So don't let that hold you back. If you're not, if you're uncomfortable, maybe you're not sure how to use these tools. We will help you figure that out so you make get the most out of this $9. It's only $9. $9 subscription. It's a third of a month for $9. Use the promo code starting nine. Our boy Jordan Klein, put it up on the screen. Awesomeo.com slash promos. Head on over there and check it out. And I think we might actually have, do we have a golf promo going on right now? We do. If you, With the Masters coming up, if you buy one month of Awesomeo Plus Golf, you get a full month free. So that's pretty incredible. $29.95. For the month gets you an entire next month totally free so whether you want to do starting nine promo nine days for nine dollars or you're big into golf you're big into the masters you're loving what we've got coming up and you want multiple months of this for the price of one check that out and all the same tools we talk about for golf as well ownership player projections you name it top golfer tool check it out Go over to awesome.com slash promos. Dustin is the golf promo. Starting nine is the baseball promo. And I go back to where we were at the uh, LA Lakers. Adam, take it away here. Slight favorites against the Raptors in Toronto or wherever. One of the biggest pieces of injury news on the slate, I think, uh, coming from the Lakers is Andre Drummond questionable for this game. It's just such a wide ranging, like, thing. you know, there's so much to talk about here because for one, we've gotten in the games that James and Davis have pl have not played. Kyle Kuzma's averaged about a fantasy point per minute. Um, Dennis Schroeder's averaged about 1.1 fantasy points per minute. Both guys would look pretty good here against a struggling Toronto team. Um, but if Drummond comes back and is able to play anywhere close to starters minutes, I expect the rates for Schroeder and Kuzma in particular to drop. You know, Drummond is a high usage guy, so I think that would hurt Schroeder. But Kuzma's got about a 14% rebounding percentage in these games without Davis and James. You know that if nothing else, Drummond's going to grab rebounds and that's going to hurt Kuzma. Um, also probably, you know, take some, some usage away from him. But then the other question mark is that in the game that Drummond did play with the Lakers, where he played 14 minutes before hurting his toe, he was terrible. Uh, picked up four fouls. Most of the you know beat writer accounts that I saw were basically saying that he was very, very clearly not in shape. So, you know, how many minutes can he play? How effective is he going to be? Um, are they going to try and start him again? Or are they going to work him back in off the bench? You know, all these things are, are stuff that we don't really know. So I think it not only do you have a really wide range of outcomes on Andre Drummond, who is really cheap on FanDuel and pretty cheap on DraftKings too. Like if he were to play 25 to 30 minutes, Drummond looks really good. If he's playing at anywhere close to full strength, 
But I think that's a really risky proposition given how he looked in his first game with the Lakers. But then the range of outcomes also is kind of wide for guys like Kuzma and Schroeder because if Drummond ends up being out, I like both of them. If Drummond is in, they both become a lot riskier. So that's another piece of information that I think is going to really change how I, uh, how I view things. Okay. This game has a really low total, but it's one of those games where it kind of doesn't matter, right, because of all of the injuries, which is why we talk about them, but – they don't necessarily mean something all of the time if the rotation is going to be shortened. Because on the other side with Nick Nurse, he ran a nine-player nine rotation yesterday. I actually thought he might run eight just given how he's done things at times. But he ran a nine-man rotation, and you saw Bembry play 30 minutes. You saw Malachi Flynn play 34 minutes off the bench. OG Ananobi played 38 minutes. Siakam played 36 and uh, Chris Boucher started, but only played 20, Adam. So that's what we had from yesterday. Bain, Stanley Johnson, and uh, Watanabe played off the bench along with Malachi Flynn. Do you see things similar today in terms of rotation, or was that maybe a fluke from the Bembry minutes? Similar, I think, but I, so there's a couple things that I think could be different. For one, I think you could see Malachi Flynn start today. Nick Nurse had said yesterday that he was going to start and then he didn't start him. Um, after the game, he said that he just didn't want to throw Malachi Flynn in there against Westbrook and potentially be right out of the gate. Dennis Schroeder obviously is neither of those guys and the Lakers don't have you know, two really good guards. So this is a spot where you could see Malachi Flynn um, start. But either way, I think that Flynn does play starters minutes, whether he starts or comes off the bench. Bembry played 30 minutes, but there is, I, I do have some concern with his rotation because he played the entire fourth quarter, um, whereas he only played about four minutes in the second quarter. So, you know, if he had played the same rotation in the second half as the first half, he would have played like 22 to 24 minutes. I think that I, I feel comfortable expecting like 24 to 26 minutes from Bembry, which at minimum salary and especially at small forward on DraftKings is still fine. Like right now, there's not that much value on the slate. So I still think he's he's a good play as far as just opening up other stuff in your lineup. But I don't feel very comfortable that we're getting 30 minutes from him again, um, especially because Gary Trent Jr. only played 31.2 minutes, only played the final two and a half minutes of the, the fourth quarter. I think you very easily could see Trent take some minutes away from Bem from Bembry here. Yeah, I thought that I thought that Flynn, even though he was coming off the bench, was going to squeeze Bembry, and he didn't all that much, right? Not the same position, but you very easily could have had a, a Flynn, Trent, Ananobi, Siakam, Boucher rotation or lineup out there for a long time. And you kind of didn't. I'm just not convinced that we get another 30 minutes from Bembry. That's my biggest concern. And right now, the reason I say that is because his ownership is coming in really high right now on DraftKings at 40%. Adam, the only guy getting more ownership is Malachi Flynn. And on FanDuel, 33.4% for Bembry because he's so cheap. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, he, he is so cheap. And, you know, like on FanDuel, I think maybe it ends up being a little bit easier to get away from him because roster construction is just a little bit different. You can only roster two shooting guards, et cetera. But on DraftKings, he's a minimum price small forward. Even if he plays 24 minutes and let's say gets 18 points, you know, 18 fantasy points is never something that you're really like striving for. But because right now there's still not a whole lot of very cheap value on the slate, even the value that's opened up in the Indiana game is mostly, um, you know, mid-range guys. I think that he's just going to let you get good enough pieces into your lineup that he's still a pretty viable option. I do think, though, that he's the kind of guy, like, if he's getting 40% ownership at 3K on, on DraftKings and Jeremy Lamb is getting one less than 1% ownership right now at 3,400, you know, I, I think Bembry plays more minutes than Lamb. I think that's very likely. But Lamb's the better fantasy producer. Um, Lamb does have a, a pretty wide range of outcomes, and he's getting no ownership. So that's the kind of play where, you know, I think even though Bembry does still serve a purpose, even if you don't think he plays 30 minutes tonight, there are some guys down there that could certainly outperform Bembry at, at much, much lower ownership. Okay, so let's close it out with this. Top options from the Toronto Raptors with Lowry out, with Van Vliet sidelined as well. Yeah, so um, you know, talked about Bembry. I think Malachi Flynn's a, a very strong play on DraftKings in particular. Um, don't you know? Don't read too much into yesterday's performance. Obviously, this is a tougher matchup against the Lakers. He also had, I think, like five stocks or something like that. Um, seven. For, se I'm sorry, what? Did, did you, you say seven? You about, are you talking about Malachi Flynn? Yeah, did you say seven? 
He had seven stocks. <laughs> I thought he, he had, had three uh, blocks yeah. and four steals. But the crazy part is he still would have had 39 DraftKings points even if he didn't have those stocks. Yeah, he had a good game anyway. Um, for the season, he's averaged 0. 0.7 DraftKings points per minute. Uh, so – you know, so it's you're still, not expecting seven stocks is what you're saying? Uh, yeah, I'm not expecting oh, seven stocks. Maybe like five. Sure. Um, <laughs> I, I'm expecting, you know, 20-something fantasy points from Flynn, um, which, which, you know, still makes him a, a pretty good option. I think that Aaron Baines is kind of interesting on DraftKings for the same reason as DeAndre Bembry. I'm not expecting that you get really more than like 20 to 22 minutes, but he's 3K flat, which just opens up some stuff in your lineup. So n- nothing I'm too confident in for Baines, but I think, you know, at least – Worth a look. Um, Siakam is, I think, the the top play from Toronto. He was pretty disappointing yesterday, but the salary is still affordable. He's going to, you know, get a lot of opportunities, both as a scorer and as a facilitator. Um, I think that, you know, there, there's no guarantee, obviously. It's not a very easy matchup here, but um, Siakam has been around a 1.3 fantasy point per minute guy without Lowry or Van Vliet on the floor going back to last season. So I think he's still underpriced here. All right. Let's move on then Memphis and Miami, the Memphis Grizzlies against the Miami Heat. We've got the Grizz five and a half point dogs, 216 total down there in South Beach. Are you on anything for the Grizzlies today? Not really, um, but I kind of mentioned it earlier in some of those early lineups I was running. Grayson Allen was just ending up in them. It's not because I think he's a very good play. It's not. I obviously don't like the matchup against he's a slow. Some ownership. Yeah, it, it's just sort of a he fits. And, you know, there's not a lot of guys at shooting guard that you really feel great about. He kind of just fits in there and lets you get to, to other plays that you do really like. I think that ownership probably comes down um, as, you know, more stuff opens up. I think Allen would be one of the first guys that stops ending up in my lineups. But if you're going to get around 30 minutes from a guy at 4,400 at a weak position, I think it's fine. Um, John Morant, you know, obviously has tournament upside, but um, overall it's just one of the least appealing matchups you can get. Miami, one of the most efficient defenses in the league, one of the slowest teams in the league. There's just not a whole lot to like, I don't think. All right. So then on the other side, the Miami heat, is there anything additionally to like for Miami today? I wouldn't say priorities, but Memphis is a fast-paced team. Um, They're solid defensively, but Jimmy Butler, I think, is a decent option at small forward. It's a pretty weak position today, and Butler's production hasn't really dropped off yet in a couple of games he's played with um, Oladipo. His usage is down, but his rebounding percentage is still at about 11%. His assist percentage is up to 40%. I think as you get more games with Oladipo active, Butler's usage increases from the 20.8% that it's been at, um, you know, kind of probably ends up somewhere in the middle between his 26% for the season and and about 21% he's had so far. And I think the assist percentage comes back a little bit, but Butler just produces in so many ways. I think you continue to get around 1.3 to 1.35 fantasy points per minute from Butler going forward. So at a weak small forward position, I think there is some merit to, to looking to him. All right. So no priority options in this game at all, but maybe just a couple secondary last man in type of play. Yeah, exactly. Denver and Detroit. The Pistons open this 14-point dogs. This one's down to 12, but they're playing their second of a back-to-back. They smoked the Thunder yesterday, so a lot of these starters didn't play starters minutes anyway. But here they go traveling out to Denver, 214 total. Uh, I think this is going to be a slaughtering of the Detroit Pistons today, and we'll see how it goes. Of course, Jamal Murray's questionable for the Denver side with that banged-up knee. But we'll kick it off with the Pistons. Is there anything here from Grant to Plumlee to Jackson that stands out? Because it seems to me that this is one of the least appealing and ugly teams to target today, unless you're looking at like a $4,300 Sadiq Bay. Yeah, I mean, it's everything on on Detroit kind of just feels like a crapshoot because the matchup's not very good. Then, I mean, there is some blowout risk, like you said. Denver clearly the, the superior team. But also, you know, Detroit just a team that doesn't really have consistent rotations right now. They kind of just uh, – do whatever, you know, and any given game, you can get, you know, guys playing a lot more or less minutes than normal. If you're going to roll the dice on some guys, you know, I think looking to Jeremy Grant obviously makes some sense. Amadou Diallo, we know, can produce at a high rate. Josh Jackson has been starting, and the Pistons have been involved in so many blowouts lately, both uh, games that they've won and games they've lost, that we haven't really seen what the closing lineup looks like, whether Josh Jackson gets fourth quarter minutes or not. But, you know, he's someone that produces about a fantasy point per minute. Saban Lee is cheap, but there's just – there's nobody outside of Jeremy Grant and Mason Plumley that I would point to on this team and say with any amount of confidence, they play more than 24 or 25 minutes. So that makes it really, really risky to get to these guys, especially in a tough matchup against Denver. Okay. So it feels like we already, so this is the sixth game we're on, right? There's eight games. This is the sixth game we've hit on a few of them. We spent a ton of time on. There's a lot on each side, Memphis, Miami, 
not a lot. But then you go to the Detroit side. So three straight teams, not a lot. What about if Jamal Murray plays? Of course, you have Nikola Jokic here against Detroit. You just hope that this game doesn't blow out early. And if it does, it's all thanks to Nikola Jokic. Is, is, a, is a healthy Denver team, assuming Jamal Murray played, a priority spot for you? Or is this another one that will just be picking and choosing a couple options? I think it's somewhere between like Memphis and teams that I really like, because I do really like Jokic here. You know, it's obviously, um, I, I think he's, you know, a really good play. The problem is just, you know, we, we haven't talked about Giannis yet, who I really, really like. Um, and there are some high upside center options, but Jokic, you know, by all means is a good play. And also one thing to keep in mind with him is that if Jamal Murray is ruled out between seven o'clock and the, the start of the Denver game, Jokic's ownership is just naturally going to be a lot lower than it would be if Murray were ruled out right now. So one thing that's nice about Jokic is um, if Murray's in, you can still get a great game out of Jokic. But if he's out, there's kind of just like built in upside there uh, potentially. So I I do kind of like that. Um, Aaron Gordon's price on DraftKings, I think, is a little bit cheap. He was sort of brought along slowly when he first uh, was traded to Denver. But in the last couple of games, he's played 39 and 34 minutes. Um, he's averaged about a fantasy point per minute since joining Denver. He, he, he's another guy where, you know, the usage isn't going to be that high playing with Jokic and Murray and, and Porter, but he rebounds, he gets assists. He's someone that certainly could benefit if Jamal Murray's out as well by taking on a bigger uh, playmaking and scoring role. So I think Aaron Gordon um, is a pretty interesting option on DraftKings too. Yeah, so do I, especially in a good spot like this. Now, the rest of this team, though, there's, there's not much, right? According to what I've seen, I, there's just not a ton that stands out for Denver. Yeah, there's not. I mean, if Murray is in, I think it's kind of just grabbing, like, in, in tournaments, you know, grabbing one of Jokic, Murray, Gordon, Porter, or even Barton, just really one of the starters, um, and saying, you know, okay, hopefully they're the ones that have a big game here in, in a decent spot against Detroit. But um, it, it would be hard for me to be, you know, playing two or three guys from Denver. By the way, boom, 511 likes. There I knew I could count on you guys. Coming through in the clutch, Milwaukee and Golden State. The Bucks as six and a half point road favorites, 237 and a half total. So fast paced game here, Adam. There's no reason it should not be a high scoring affair. The Warriors play at the second fastest pace in the league, trailed just by a little margin, a small margin by the Bucks, who play at the third fastest pace in the league. Now, both teams have had pretty exceptional defense this season, namely the Bucks, but also, the, the Golden State Warriors are, are ninth in defensive rating. This is going to be a high-scoring game. So let's kind of dissect this a little bit and see whether or not the fact that it's going to be high-scoring is enough for us to load up. Because to my estim- by my estimation, yes, Giannis Antetokounmpo, really, really solid play, as he always is. He's probable. Uh, and then on the other side, some Dre and some Curry. But I don't know if this game as a whole is appealing as it might look like on the surface before you dig in. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's it's a good game. Uh, one thing to point out, too, is Golden State's really fallen off defensively lately. Uh, 26th in defensive rating over the last month, which is 13 games for them. But almost, or I think kind of more importantly, over that time, they've allowed the fourth most points in the paint, which, you know, anyone that's watched Giannis play basketball knows that's a problem if, you, if you're if you not uh, protecting the rim, not defending the paint. Like, to have any chance of slowing him down, you have to be able to force him to, to take jump shots. And um, Golden State's really struggled uh, recently, you know, defending so I think it sets up really really nicely for Giannis I love him he, he's my he's my number one payoff option on the slate but even you know in tournaments looking to guys like Chris Middleton looking to Drew Holiday they're a little bit more expensive than I would like um but they still you know have 50 plus point upside Holiday's been playing really really well lately and especially if in your your lineup build if you can't get to Giannis if you're playing Jokic if you're playing Embiid you know um for example we had talked about you know using Embiid as a low owned high you know a low owned expensive player in tournaments if you go that route it makes a lot of sense to then follow it up by playing Chris Middleton or Drew Holiday hope that one of those guys takes over for Milwaukee and Giannis has one of those games where he kind of takes the back seat because then you're kind of just increasing your your likelihood you know kind of uh, making your path a little bit um, easier to taking down a tournament you know Embiid has a good game and then you also get the guy that does better from Milwaukee than Giannis. So I think um, those, Middleton and Andrew make some sense as sort of leverage plays against Giannis. Okay. They have Josh Hart out at least three weeks, Alexander Walker at least two. That's, that's, that's interesting. All right. They're banged up pretty good. The Golden State Warriors then we've got – by the way, I didn't know they were 26 over the last – it's kind of weird though. What changes enough for this defense to play or see such a precipitous drop-off in, in defensive rating – and, and points in the paint. 
I mean, it, it kind of, it's one of those things that kind of just changes. It, it can flows. change a pretty good amount pretty, pretty quickly anyway. Yeah. Um, but they also, like, they weren't expected to be one of the better defensive teams. Draymond Green has made a big difference this year. But, um, you know, yeah, I, I think it's probably a combination of they're not as bad as they've been. They're not as good as they were earlier either, though. Sure. Yeah, and I always look at defensive rating and not points per game because a team could allow a decent amount of points per game uh, and still just create super inefficient uh, uh, offenses because they play at a fast pace. So it's going to create more scoring. But really, how efficient are they? And the Milwaukee Bucks are pretty good. But they're one of those teams, too, that other teams, opposing teams, can have big games against them just because there's so much additional opportunity in terms of field goal attempts. And remember, it's not just scoring. It's peripherals. More possessions means more rebounds, means more block attempts, means more steals, all of that stuff. Which brings me to Stephen Curry, $9,700 on DraftKings on FanDuel. Curry weighing in at $9,500. You already said your favorite payup option is Giannis. You like Embiid for tournaments. How does Steph Curry fit into the equation today when there's already a couple guys up top that you're feeling good about? Yeah, I mean, I think Steph's a very good play. Right now, it looks like his ownership is about where it should be. We have him at 18% on DraftKings, 15.5% chance of being in the optimal lineup. He's obviously a very high upside play. He can go out there and just knock down, you know, a million threes against anybody. Um, he kind of, his average production is a little bit lower than most expensive guys. Like you look at Jokic, who's not that much more expensive. He's 1.6 fantasy points per minute and beads in a similar range. Curry's, you know, 1.4 to 1.45. But the reason he's so expensive is because he does have that really high usage rate and that ability to just, you know, drop 60 um, actual points in a game. So he's kind of overpriced for his average projection in a way, not so much like him, but just compared to the other stars that aren't that much more expensive. Um, but I, you know, I, I think that it's not like he's getting 40% ownership or anything like that either. So I think Curry looks really good. Um, I think Draymond Green on DraftKings looks really interesting to me because he's typically playing 34 to 36 minutes in competitive games. This is a fast paced game where he's, you're going to get more possessions. And even though he's not a high usage guy doesn't score a lot of points. He still rebounds. He has about a 35% assist percentage in the games he's played with Curry this year. And on DraftKings in particular, where he is less expensive than, than FanDuel, you get the double double bonus, you get the triple double bonus, which adds value to, to Green as well. And the power forward position is not the, the top end, I think, is good with Giannis and Siakam. But once you get past that, it's not really the best position. So I think Draymond on DraftKings looks like a, a really good play. Okay. So Draymond and then Giannis on the other side, how much do you think Curry, how much Curry do you think you're going to end up having? Um, I mean, I'm playing one lineup, but I, oh, okay. I think like if, if I were playing 150 lineups, um, looking at the information we have right now, as far as ownership goes, I would expect to be coming in around like 20 to 25% on stuff. Okay. So a decent amount for sure. Yeah. Like he, he's projected for 20% ownership. I assume I'd be around there. Makes sense. All right. One game to go. And uh, appreciate you guys always hanging with us throughout the entirety of the show. Be sure, if you're still here, to stick around afterwards. Chris Baggs, Eric Linkwist got you on live before a lot going all the way up to seven. Still a lot of news. Don't walk away from your laptop or for your phone for wherever you're at. A lot of news that could break and completely eviscerate so much that Adam and I have talked about. I don't think it will, right, because this is helpful stuff. But be sure to stick around. And be sure to check out our sponsor, No House Advantage fantastic new peer-to-peer -peer player prop site. You could go and download the app, No House Advantage. You could go and get $20 free when you use the promo code AWESEMO, A-W-E-S-E-M-O. When you sign up and deposit, get that match deposit bonus. And you get all of the free tools at awesomeo.com. It's really the best part about it. Go to awesomeo.com, use the free uh, uh, No House Advantage player prop tool, player projection, or uh, player prop tool, sorry, and the optimal lineups tool as well. So you're getting the bonus. You're playing on a site where there's a legitimate edge. The, the odds are static. They don't change throughout the day. So if you, if you fancy yourself a sharp person that is able to pick up on this or just someone that's willing to compare them against other books, to compare them to Alex's player prop projections, to the awesome uh, No House Advantage tool, all of that stuff, it's a great way to really build your bankroll. Even if you're looking to move some of that money over to DraftKings and FanDuel and make a little bit of extra money, maybe hit that, try and hit that big six-figure payday. They don't have that on No House Advantage. It's a great way to build your bankroll and do whatever you want with that afterwards. But get your free 20, use the free tools at Osimo, and download the No House Advantage app. Check out the peer-to-peer -peer player prop uh, site. It's GPP style format, right? So you're picking eight of them in a contest instead of having to bet singles on, on all of these other books. 
Really fun. I think you'll enjoy it. No House Advantage, sponsor of the Deeper Dive. And while you're over at Awesomeo using those tools, we got plenty of free content today that we'd love for you to check out. NBA player projections, MLB top pitchers tool. That's one of my favorite tools. PGA pro plays and NHL player projections. So make that happen. No reason not to head over there. All right. Ready to close this out? Yeah. Portland and the Clippers. No use of Nurkic for Portland today. Six point dogs, 229 total. I actually want to start with Ennis Cantor, whose price point has come down to 6K. What do you think of him with no Nurkic in the offense or in the lineup today? I think he's a pretty good tournament play. Um, doesn't really stand out to me in cash games just because I think that he's at a somewhat awkward price point where um, either I'm going to go a little bit cheaper and get a little bit better point per dollar play, or I'm going to pay up and get someone like Jokic or, or Capella or, you know, whoever. Um, but I think that has the potential to make him a, a pretty good contrarian option in tournaments, you know, right now only projected for about 8% ownership. And I think that, um, it's a, a decent spot for him. Um, you know, Nurkic being out, certainly, you know, he should move into the starting lineup. He's averaged about 1.2 uh, DraftKings points per minute in the games that he has started with Lillard and with McCollum this year. He's averaged about 30 minutes per game. So I think he's a good play. I think he's got a pretty high ceiling for, for his salary. Okay. Jamal Parker, thank you for the super chat, brother. What do you think about the backcourt here, Damian Lillard, uh, CJ McCollum? Yeah, I mean, Lillard, I think it's, it's going to be tough to prioritize just because, you know, he's – with McCollum back, on average, he's not quite as productive a player as, you know, Steph Curry at a similar price point. Um, Trey Young's a little bit cheaper. But the one thing is that Lillard still has that massive ceiling. You know, he doesn't have big games nearly as, as frequently without McCollum or with McCollum. But, you know, he's projected for 7% ownership. So I do think he's someone that, you know, you can sprinkle in the tournament lineups just if you need a lower owned high upside guy. But I don't think he looks like one of the better plays just because, you know, there, there's other guards around him that look pretty good. I think um, the column I'm actually a little bit more interested in because the shooting guard position is not really that strong. And he obviously is less expensive than Lillard, but he's averaged about one and a quarter DraftKings points per minute um, this season in the games that he's played with Lillard. That's a step forward from last year. And, you know, he's played really, really well. You also get a little bit more usage with Nurkic out of the lineup being replaced by Cantor. Right now, McCollum projected for 7% ownership on DraftKings, which is the same as Lillard, but McCollum with a 9% chance of being in the optimal compared to 5.7% for Dame. So I um, actually do have a little bit more interest in McCollum. All right. Is that it for the Portland Trail Blazers? We can wrap this one up with the Clippers. Got about three minutes to go. Yeah, that's it for the Blazers. All right. No Serge Ibaka, Patrick Beverly, questionable. And I'm sure Paul George will be ruled out five minutes after this game starts. <laughs> Talk to me about it. Yeah, I think the Clippers actually look like one of the more appealing teams here. It's a good matchup against Portland. They're not very good defensively. Um, and some pretty favorable pricing on some of the Clippers. Uh, Paul George, 8,100 on DraftKings. 8,700 on FanDuel is fine, but um, 8,100 stands out on DraftKings. He's averaged almost the same fantasy points per minute this year as Kawhi Leonard in the games that they've played together. He's averaged about one minute fewer per game in those games, but you're getting an $1,100 discount on DraftKings. You're getting, I think, an $800 discount on FanDuel. So I think George looks really, really good here. I think Kawhi is fine, especially when you factor in that small forward's not a very good position. Kind of similar to Jimmy Butler for me, where I don't think I'm going out of my way to get to Leonard over some of the other payoff options. But if he fits in, you know, it's clearly nothing wrong with him. And he's, he's one of the, you know, higher projected small forwards, but then you also have, um, if it's a who is 5,400 on DraftKings and on FanDuel, I would expect around 30 minutes, if not more here. Um, he's got, you know, Ennis Cantor, who is a traditional center going up against him. So that works in his favor. But we've also seen um, the one that really comes to mind is when the Clippers played Luka Doncic, you had, uh, Tyron Luke come out before the game and say basically that he wanted Zubats on the floor every minute that, that Doncic was on the floor to protect the rim um, and, and, you know, to be out there. I think you could see maybe additional playing time too, just because you do have two aggressive driving point guards in or guards in, in Lillard and in McCollum. So I, I think Zubats is just cheaper than he really should be. And uh, Marcus Morris kind of as well, especially on FanDuel at 4,900. He's averaging almost 30 minutes per game in the games that he has started with Leonard and with George active. He's averaged about 0.9 DraftKings points per minute. Um, just sort of a guy that fits nicely into some lineups at, um, at, at the Ford spots. All right. Well, we came in under the number 559. How about that? Second time this year it's happened, I think. Second time this year it's happened. If you guys want to join the awesome YouTube channel too, that little join button down there, gives you some cool stuff, right? Gets you the uh, the the emojis, 
there's one of me, there's one of Ben, there's one of Alex, there's a money time, there's a bunch of other stuff. We got some great stuff in the works and those cool badges that for the longer you're here, go up from gold to, to diamond to platinum and then the awesome O'Gradient, super cool stuff. If you were gonna super chat or something without a question and you just wanted to, to be nice, which is greatly appreciated, instead, hey, join it, it's 2.99, right? Join, join the channel, that's fine. Instead of a super chat, I'm happy to see it. I love seeing all of those uh, those badges and avatars pop up. It makes my day. 600 likes. Get to seven for our producer, Jordan Klein. This fella's here like 10 hours a day. He worked over Easter. He's just putting in work all the time. And we love you for it, brother. We'll see you guys back here soon. Spags and Eric Linkwist coming up next. Don't go anywhere. Live before lock on the other side. Cool. See you guys. What's up, guys? Been obsessively playing with my mic filter, like the bendiness of it, for the last 15 minutes, and I can't get it right where I want it to be. It's very upsetting. Really sorry about that. Thank you. I know. I knew you'd get it, Eric. Too. I'm sensitive like that. It's like the puppet dance. It fits because people say you sound like Kermit. <laughs> Kermit, Kermit Frog here, Kermit Frog here. <laughs> We're not hot, are we? Oh, we are. Oh, good. I didn't even mean the mics, but you know. What is up, guys? It is time for a little NBA Live Before Lock. You have one hour left to lock until uh, DraftKings and FanDuel are going to be starting their slates in an extra 30 minutes until No House Advantage starts their slate. So we are going to be on here an extra 30 minutes. I demand that if I have to do a Live Before Lock show this week, I want to go 90 minutes and not a second less because I'm Chris Spags and I'm joined by a man who's going to help me through this process, help me with No House Advantage as well as DraftKings and FanDuel. You know him, you love him. He's Eric Lindquist. How are you doing, Eric? I'm doing great, feeling very professional. I'm ready to go. I was not doing funny voices earlier. I am ready to go. I, I could do like the trailer, in a world, treaded by water. We're ready to go. I'm glad you bring some fresh bits here because I only bring the stale bit of money time, which means that the halfway point of the show, if you guys want to get some free ownership projections, the top five owned plays on DraftKings and FanDuel, smash that like button now. Our pal Loffy and Adam as well, though I don't think Adam really cares about the number of likes, but I know Loffy <laughs> does. And he, no, he was really, not. he was, no, Adam, honestly, Adam might not even know there's a like button on YouTube. <laughs> he just doesn't even go to the page. But you guys hit that like button now. Get us to 1,000 likes and I will give you guys the top five owned plays on DraftKings and FanDuel according to Osmo's own ownership projections. And also the player projections are free on the site today. So make sure you go over to the projections page. Go to Osmo.com if you haven't been there before. Check the top tab and you will find in the NBA category all the projections that you need today for free. Uh, so go check that out. And of course, you wouldn't be able to do this show today if it weren't for our sponsors over at No House Advantage. So make sure you are playing over there today. And we're going to do the extra 30-minute show today because they are locking at 4.30 Pacific time, 7.30 Eastern time. But really the big thing with No House Advantage, it's peer-to-peer your prop betting where you're doing a DFS format but with prop bets. We talk about it a lot on the tip-off show every day. Honestly, there are always some very easy bets to make on there to build around. Uh, some of the ones today, I know Kyle Kuzma's over on rebounds is one that looked particularly good earlier today. We're going to hit on some of them as we go. Make sure you are going over to nohouseadvantage.com now or download no House, uh, no House Advantage app. And use the promo code OSMO when you sign up because they'll give you a $20 first match deposit bonus. So go nohouseadvantage.com, download No House Advantage app. We'll be talking more about them 
coming up after DraftKings and FanDuel Lock. Um, but Eric, let's get into this one right away here because we do have a lot of news. And you did the tip-off show. I watched it earlier as well, so I saw some of your guys' takes. And as always the case, when we do the tip-off, there's then deeper dive, then the injury report comes out. And then everything you guys said on the tip-off or that we said on the tip-off goes completely to shit. So now it's the case again here. A lot of things changed. What's been the most important news that's come out to you in the last couple hours since you last talked about this slate? I mean, I don't know about most important, but we just got a loco bomb. I don't, I don't really know what's our Woj bomb equivalent for El Negro Loco for uh, him lighting it up. But we just got news that Zion is likely to play, and Brandon Ingram is unlikely to play. Uh, I think that that's enough. And then we just got another piece of Andre Drummond's already ruled out. I just saw that on oh. uh, on a Twitter on a on a verified account, somebody somebody that I trust uh, for Lakers news and so I, I saw that that's coming through so i'm assuming that's going to hit here in a second so i think both of those pieces of news just hit and uh so i think we got to kind of react to those yeah i guess uh that is some more big news here also dwayne deadman signing with the heat so good to see him back in the league as a, a decent permanent producer who's going to yeah. now clog up that heat rotation even more one would presume but i guess let's talk about this new orleans news and i'll tease out i do have one news item that gave me one player i did not expect to be very heavy on at an unbelievable amount on DraftKings. but new orleans here um i would think whenever this has been the case historically when one of ingham or zion is out uh, you're going to want to play the other one for the most part and zion's price is fairly high but you're down another high usage score and akil alex Alexander Walker. Um, I think you are going to have Lonzo back in barring some other weird news that comes up here, but that's not really enough to get me off of Zion. And I think 8,900 on DK, not a bad price on FanDuel either. I think he's a guy who's going to take a pretty big jump projection wise when you account for Ingram being out, but how are you feeling about Zion now? And I guess, how does this change the overall picture for you for the Pelicans going against Atlanta? I mean, you said he has not, I mean, his price is 9,700 on FanDuel. So it's oh. not pretty over there uh 80 8900 or yeah i believe it was 8900 8, over on dk i like getting to that a lot i think that he projects out pretty well points per dollar if you're going to give him 36 minutes uh right out of the gate and it seems as though the trend has been for van gundy to just allow anybody who's in the rotation you better be able to play full minutes for me right out of the gate there's no building up of minutes there's no 15 20 minutes to to eke zion back into play like he was either going to be a full go or he's not and so i think that this I don't know. I was kind of hoping that it was going to be Ingram, just a little bit of a cheaper piece on this slate. But man, I, I really, really like getting to Zion. We're going to have to track his ownership like we always do leading up to lock because this news came out plenty early. I think it allows people to project and, and to, to really react to that news. We'll kind of see where it gets at. If it gets well over 20, 25%, that would be something I'd be looking to maybe just be at the field and not go crazy on. But you got to think that this kind of kills any idea that you were thinking about Lonzo Ball as well with the price increase up to 7,500. Alonzo coming off an injury. Osmo has Lonzo in for 35 minutes and we just got a projections update, but it seems like that one was uh, made or put in right before the Ingram news came through. So we'll see how the minutes look here, but you know, just the, the lack of production from Ingram, who's been about a 28% used to rate guy on the year, a little bit higher, depending upon the chunks of the season you're looking at. It does seem like him being out for me. I think on DraftKings going to make Zion dual position eligible power forward and center. Um, I imagine he's a guy I'll get a lot of though. There are some other plays that are going to probably pop up as real to this. So we'll keep an eye out. And I guess Eric, is there anybody, else you think takes a big jump minutes wise i know we do have um isaiah thomas expected to make his debut he's in for 13 minutes from osmo does this mean more minutes for james johnson i i would guess would be that one i guess you could see west Wando too but i'm gonna assume either guy is still gonna be not in play for you so i'm trying to figure this out right now i just took brandon ingram and Nikhil alexander walker off the floor we got zion williamson 33.3 percent usage over 263 minutes lonzo ball still at 29.2 usage uh, in 79 minutes, a little bit more limited sample. I try not to take everybody off the floor or you're going to get like 10 minutes out of those yeah. guys. If you take like Kira Lewis Jr., that's just kind of one of those games you have to to kind of play who you're going to take off. Those are the two main cogs to, to take away from it. So maybe Lonzo isn't somebody that I want to be as reactionary to as what I just said I was. Maybe you could still see a little bit of a ceiling there because if this were a scenario where they were all healthy uh, and Lonzo was like 68, 6,900 and you were just say, hey, uh, Brandon, Ringham, Brandon Ingram gets ruled out, you would still have Lonzo Ball interest, I'm assuming, in that kind of a situation. And so that's that's a lot higher usage than what I was anticipating to see out of him there. So I, I think he's maybe going to be okay and project out all right, so long as he's not garnering a bunch of ownership. Eric Bledsoe, 
uh, go all the way down to 18.2% usage. Uh, not going to be as enthusiastic to get to much of him there, especially because now you do bring Isaiah Thomas. We were going through a couple of his rates. Greg brought it up on the tip-off show where he had usage up into the 30s, even in like limited minutes with Washington and Denver in years past. So that's a, like even in 12 minutes, that's somebody's coming into Chuck. We know he's not showing up in New Orleans to go play defense. So if he plays limited minutes there, that's enough takeaway off of the top of, of Eric Bledsoe that I don't think you need to take that shot now that he's 6,100 on DK. And we don't really need to even like think about playing him on a two position fan duel site. Yeah. I also, uh, the minutes projections that get updated by Osmo along with the regular projections. And it does seem Zion did take a jump upwards where I think he looks more usable than he would have. And this is something we've talked about a lot, at least on the shows I've been on. And I know uh, some of our other hosts here on the channel have had similar debates about Zion. Uh, but you know, the median projection for him is always tough. And I think it's kind of goes in hand in hand with what Adam was talking about on the deeper dive before us with Steph Curry, where you, know, you look at his average points per game. They're not going to be as high as some other guys who are at that same salary because you're paying more for the volatility. The fact that he can put up 70 fantasy points, right? rather than the fact that he's putting up 45 to 50 every single night, you know, necessarily. I think that's kind of the case for Zion, not to quite the same extent, but um, to me in this spot, it just makes him a lot easier, a lot more palatable where I don't think you have to force anything here. I imagine I'll get a good amount of Zion though. I still would have Kawhi a little bit ahead of him in terms of the fantasy point projection, even being a little more expensive on DraftKings. Yep. Like it. You, sir, are sharp. So let's keep going through here. And the play that I was talking about earlier, let's give it to you guys uh, in a second. But again, hit that like button here. We need to get a bunch more likes. I'll, I'll even say if we got to 800, I'd give you guys a top five owned plays because Lafayette did such a good job of cleaning up everything there uh, that we need you guys to help us out, continue to help the channel grow and stick with all the competition out there. There's a lot of new channels popping up. So hit that like button here. Really like any YouTube videos you want um, that you enjoy out there. And make sure you're subscribed to the channel as well because you have content around the clock for every single sport out there. Got one super chat real fast to grab James Kendon saying, Hey guys, I'm in the 888 K DraftKings single bullet. Josh cost me last night and talked me out of Julius Randall. Anyways, serious question here, Tatum, Dennis Schroeder or Kuzma and Trey young. Let's go spags. Now all the pressure. I don't want him bashing me in a super chat. Like he just did poor Josh here, but Eric, I'll ask you first. So even though he's, he's saying, let's go spags. I'm saying, let's go, Eric, who would you want Tatum and Dennis Schroeder or Kuzma and Trey young? Uh, I mean, I'm really, as strange as it is, I'm really not on any of those four. So this becomes uh, a subjective question in that regard. I'm not, uh, take it for, for face value. I think I would probably, with with the news that Drummond's going to be out, Kuzma is somebody who I think could spike a little bit more of a rebound upside. I'm really not on Trey Young here today at all, but I would say that because he's at a little bit lower price point to Tatum, I'm probably going to side on the Kuzma Trey Young side of it. Also, thank you so much for the super chat. We're also not clicking the button for you. Julius Randle was a great play. You could have played Julius Randle in that spot. We know the kind of ceiling that he has. So uh, let it be known. Uh, just, you know, 888, good luck. Go crush it. But uh, uh, out of those four, I'm not on any of them with any bulk whatsoever. But I, I would side on the Kuzma Trey Young side. Yeah, I'm on the same page there. I would go Kuzma and Trey Young. I think um, out of those guys, I have Tatum to be the lowest, uh, the lowest value projection out of those guys. Certainly can get there, could spike an upside, but you do have Jalen Brown in there. You do have Kemba Walker in there. You do have Marcus Smart in there. I think for me, you know, even though Fournier is out, having one of those, you know, normal Celtics guys we've seen for the last couple of years, I think out of the rotation is more meaningful for Tatum today. Uh, so to me, it's Trey Young. And I think also Kuzma, one of my preferred plays on the slate right now, though, it's going to be relative to the ownership he gets on our final ownership numbers here. Um, let's keep going through here. And the play that I was hinting at earlier, and I'm curious to see where you landed with it because it's always one cause for concern for me when my projection jumps up to be a lot higher than where Osmo has a guy. But Miles Turner took a gigantic jump for me when Demonsa Sabonis got ruled out. And the rates for him are, I think, more pronounced. And you could nickel and dine them a little bit, maybe downgrade them for having Karis LeVert out, but or for having Karis LeVert in there. But to me, if you have Brogdon and Sabonis out, I think it, you can justify getting a Miles Turner to be a 23.7% use rate, which is where he's been without Sabonis, 14% rebound rate. At his price on DraftKings, 6,200, I think Sabonis, uh, that Turner is really one of the best center plays and honestly, probably my favorite play on the night. Uh, we'll see how the sorting process looks here as we got the ownership updates, but how are you feeling about miles Turner? Does anybody else take a big jump up for you with the Pacers given that again, no Demonsa Sabonis, no Malcolm Brogdon for them tonight. Yeah. I'm, I'm really nervous about what Karis Levert's ownership is going to come up to because I was on 
way, I was probably 30x the field off of like 1% that he was on FanDuel earlier today. I'm curious where he's going to be on FanDuel now at 8K. 7,200, he was already garnering a little bit of ownership. And now that that news broke that you're going to get both of them out, uh, I think that that really opens it up for him. Somebody that we've seen the kind of ceiling he has in the bubble. We saw it last game with some of those guys in 51 uh, right out of the gate against San Antonio in a in a much faster paced game. I was very surprised by this total too. I mean, it's, it's a, one of the higher totals totals on the board tonight. Uh, I really like getting to, to Levert there. Uh, Miles Turner, I'm, I'm right there with you. Uh, if you go back and look at some of his rate data from a year ago too, uh, Miles Turner, the thing that makes people so frustrated about him is that the blocks are so inconsistent in terms of like he'll go for seven, he'll go for one. And it won't really affect like his profile. And it can happen whether he's popular or not. It's just it's just a, a matter of consequence of it happening or not. Obviously, we want to have the ceiling game, which is going to require, I think, two, three, four blocks there. I'm fully capable of it. One of the highest block rates in the entire NBA looking at it. Uh, I love getting to Turner. Yeah, Turner, to me, definitely took a gigantic jump upwards and I think a very solid play. The guy, though, it looks like ownership-wise, taking a gigantic jump. And let's tease us out again here again. We'll give you guys some of the top five owned plays on DraftKings and FanDuel coming up in 15 minutes. But it does seem TJ McConnell taking the biggest jump upwards. And I know this is something that you've talked about with Ryan on the Slate Starter podcast as well as early on the tip off, but um, there has been, you know, a lot of Edward Edmund Sumner kind of taking the minutes away, or at least being more productive than he has historically been even picking up a start sort of has deferred more minutes wise TJ McConnell, but that hasn't been the case recently where McConnell at least hasn't showed a gigantic upside. And now he is going to be one of the highest owned plays on both DraftKings and FanDuel today. Um, I think on no house advantage, if you have any McConnell props that you wanted to grab, I know actually that game might not be available on that slate. Uh, no, that's one of the games nope. that's not available. Nope. On no house advantage today, but obviously theoretically, that's one you would want to go to a lot where uh, the line was made, not knowing that Brogdon and Sabonis would be out. Now he's uh, now those guys are out and you're going to have a much better version of TJ McConnell. That said, it's a lot of ownership for him on the day where you have value that ha also has a lot of opportunity up behind that we're going to talk about with Toronto. Are you feeling this much love for TJ McConnell as the chalk point guard of the day? I, I don't mind it. And the main reason I don't mind it is look at who else is in that range over on DraftKings. I mean, where else would you be looking at pivoting? You got Nikhil Alexander Walker out now. Kemba Walker, 6,600, garnering around, I would say, appropriate ownership at about 10% there on DK. You go down a little bit further, Lou Williams uh, is not playable. Isaiah Thomas, hilarious. Uh, looking down here a little bit further into like some of the more owned plays. Malachi Flynn is 3,900, but he's on the bottom end. It's just kind of like a no man's land uh, at point guard and at the guard position in general in that mid range. And he by far projects out as a guy that you can basically secure for 30 minutes, which is hard to come by on this slate. And every single slate is different. I think he's kind of a requirement of this slate at this point in time. However, I will let it be known that like, I, I didn't really, I kind of poo-pooed Sumner uh, to a certain extent here, but we did see a 26.3% usage for him. Uh, the last start out, and then obviously put out up to 30 minutes against San Antonio, played pretty darn well in that spot in a six-point win. Uh, does get a little bit of rebounding in, uh, six rebounds in the last two as well. So I think he has more ability to maybe get there at 3,800 than what I was originally anticipating. I, I, I don't completely hate getting to a little bit of him, but I think the priority is definitely TJ McConnell, who's shown to be a much better point-per-minute producer. Uh, and, and again, just kind of a consequence of the slate where there's nobody else that I really want to play in that mid-range at guard. So I, I like getting to about the field, maybe even a little bit more than that already large number. Yeah, I'm, I feel like I'm a little more inclined to just be with the field on McConnell, but that's going to be, again, relative to the, the crunching process and the sorting process and all that. But, um, you know, he definitely is going to be owned. And I agree. Like, I don't think he kills you. I think for cash, he's now uh, obviously one of the preeminent players of the day and one that you probably should be starting in your first build for a cash build. Uh, but I think for me, for tournaments, it wouldn't shock. Honestly, it wouldn't shock me if I got a lot more than the field. And it wouldn't shock me if I ended up with just a lot less if the ownership ends up to creeping up as it has been so far. Um, over 30% on DK, over 40% on FanDuel. One last guy for Indiana, and maybe you have some more here uh, to bring up, but for me, Doug McDermott was another value play that took a pretty big jump upwards for Osmo, just shy of 26 fantasy points. Those player projections are free today, so you can check them out yourself on the site. Uh, but big jump for McDermott, and does seem like the minutes get more secure for him. The rates also take a little bit of a jump above 20% usage for him without Sabonis. So I don't mind Doug McDermott as a value play here. I would say probably a tier below some of the Toronto ball handlers who still need to talk about, but how are you feeling about Doug McDermott for you as a play that has dual position eligibility on DraftKings and might be a different play on FanDuel though? Yeah, it's different because on FanDuel now, I think 
at power forward. I, I think there's just other positions that I kind of want to get to uh, or other spots. I don't want to get to 4,200. I get why the ownership is where it is, but like, look at what, what is his true ceiling of this spot? Like, what would you be happy getting from Doug McDermott? We do have a couple of like 33s and 34.5s in that box score. Uh, so if you're, if you're looking around at like what the ceiling could be, you are taking Brogdon and Sabonis, your number one and number two options off the floor here. And now you have a shooter getting inserted in. I will say I am a little bit wary because of how much I do love Karis Levert. I loved him coming into today. I think that it becomes difficult to expect. I, I have a group set up where I'm only getting one of the two, and, and it seems as though it's siding a lot more with the Karis Levert side of it, just the way that my projections are set up. Uh, I'm skewing right off of Alex's data a little bit. 28 minutes sounds about appropriate, but I, I, don't, I don't know. For somebody who doesn't get there in any other way, has a very low rebounding rate for a power forward or for, I, I guess he's technically a small forward, I just don't see like a double double upside from him in any way, shape, or form. I he needs to get there in raw scoring. So he he grades out like a like a tier below, like a Jordan Clarkson inserted into this kind of a situation, garnering a bunch of ownership. I'm right now about half the field, and I think I'm probably going to maintain there on both sides. Yeah, he's definitely become a lot chalkier in our recent ownership runs. Um, so I could see why that might be something that you move away from a bit. And you're going to find some similarly projected plays at that price point. So I think that is one thing that ownership-wise, well, I think uh, for me, when I sorted before the show, he was at under 1% ownership because the news hadn't come down. The, all the ownership projections hadn't been updated. Um, I think it's going to be a different story now that he's around 30% on both sites for, for Doug McDermott. Any other Pacers for you? We could talk Toronto, but uh, Goga Batatse is really the last one I could see maybe getting to here. He's yeah, I, I don't think... I I don't think Goga can really get, I mean, he's 3K. So you can make the argument for anybody who's 3K who, hey, he could maybe play 18, 20 minutes. You can always make that argument, but then you're using a center spot on him. That's not very wise here on this slate, I don't think. And then also uh, you're you're not really seeing, I, I haven't seen him get his minutes extended forever uh, for this Pacers team. So I, I really don't really like going to that situation. I think with Bembry and some of these other pieces that are under 4K, uh, obviously Malachi Flynn, I don't think there's really the requirement to use up a center spot on a guy like Goga. I do kind of like some of the stuff Adam was talking about with Jeremy Lamb on the front end of it. Uh, who knows if he ends up possibly getting to 22 minutes. You're bringing two guys off the floor. If he goes out and plays well, and this is kind of an argument I make for a lot of guards in large field tournaments. If a guy goes out and starts knocking down shots, they get extended run. This used to be the Terrence Ross kind of situation in Orlando where he goes out and he misses, he goes 0 for 5 in his first shift. Yeah, that lineup's probably dead. But if he goes out and goes 4 for 6, you could be looking at a 30-minute upside on a guy who's just too low-owned. I think Jeremy Lamb has that kind of potential where he could come out, put his foot down early, get to 24 minutes somehow. Uh, they're going to need different offensive pieces to, to get the ball in the bucket with Savonis and Brogdon out. So I, I really like getting to 3,400 there. Really not looking to take that shot on FanDuel. Okay. Yeah, no, I think that's, that's a reasonable way to look at it. And uh, I, yeah, certainly with Jeremy lamb, the minutes projection from Ospo, not the best, I would have a little bit of a tougher time getting there, but mm -hmm. he is probably, you know, somewhat of a logical pivot, I guess, really, if you grouped Doug McDermott, Justin holiday and Jeremy lamb together uh, on a fantasy cruncher grouping, and you said, give me one of these guys, I wouldn't hate it because I think that's sort of where that production gets carved up. Um, but yeah, that's to me, I don't have the so, most faith yeah. in lamb getting a ton of minutes would be my to main back on that for a second. Like, I think they're all cheap enough in that situation with those guys that you you're fine with that. The main reason I'm doing the, the McDermott and lamb, uh, or sorry, the McDermott Levert deal where I'm, I'm kind of just taking each one's projection down when one goes off, uh, is just for that exact event is that I think they're a little bit more usage based. Like Doug mm -hmm. McDermott is not going to hit a ceiling. I think if Levert goes for 35 real points, uh, I likewise, it would be hard for me to imagine Levert. Obviously we can, he can get there in a, a multitude of ways that Mc, McDermott can't, but, uh, it just allows for me to get a little bit less of a guy that I'm already not super high on, uh, for this slate. I like playing Doug McDermott as a last man in, in a situation where he's 3,800. Well, he's not 3,800 on FanDuel today. He takes up a power forward spot. I'm not going to do that. Okay, that's reasonable. Uh, again, guys, we're going to do the money time here in seven minutes. The, the money time. I'm sounding like an adult talking about the TikTok <laughs> or whatever. But hit that it's like button, great. guys. Not Get great. us 800 likes, and we'll give you guys the top five owned plays for DraftKings and FanDuel coming up in seven minutes. I know you can get there. we got 740 uh, likes right now. It's 2,800 people in chat, so we appreciate all you guys tuning in. And if you're new to the channel, make sure you subscribe. Check out a lot of content on here, and take a day. Honestly, if you hate the channel, if you think we all suck on here, then more power to you. Go find somewhere else that brings you joy. But give it a shot here. We have so much content 
content around the clock starting at 6 30 in the morning on the east coast with east coast with josh's process videos so uh give it a shot make sure to subscribe to the channel and hit that like button now um let's talk about toronto real fast here we're obviously going to talk a lot about toronto throughout everything we're doing as we already have but everybody knows by now yesterday and if you don't know maybe you're watching the national championship game didn't pay attention uh toronto's guards went off yesterday with no fred van vliet he's out again kyle lowry's still out with his foot infection or whatever's going on there malachi flynn went off in a way that seems a little unsustainable with the seven stocks in that game as they talked about on the deeper dive a lot of defensive things there that guy came out swinging didn't seem like he was happy to not start when he came off the bench and certainly uh, played with some fire as you might expect from a guy named malachi and then we also had a start for deandre bembry in that spot he played good minutes had probably one of his best fantasy games at least as a toronto raptor he had some decent days as a hawk but uh today it looks like these guys are in for big roles again and for big ownership again is there any reason why you'd move away from him today eric because I think a lot of people will be locking these guys in as though they're going to do what they did yesterday. And that was against Washington. Today's against admittedly a shorthanded Lakers, but um, not quite Washington. No, uh, you, you just, for me, you can't like, I, I refuse to believe that there's a situation where you're going to find another pivot. Like who else is in that range? Like Ben Bree, you know, in, in a floor situation, let's say Malachi Flynn gets into this starting lineup, which I don't believe we have here at this point in time. Um, but I, I think it's probably going to be the same as yesterday. They ended up winning a close game. Nice shot, Gary Trent Jr. Uh, even though you did nothing for our lineups other than that. Uh, I'm pretty sure that it's just the exact same situation. Like what's the opportunity cost of pivoting to a guy like who else is in that 3K range that you're looking at? Goga Batadze you brought up. Uh, that's not even like remotely close between him and Bembry. There's like a eight minute to 10 minute gap between the two of them for me. Uh, there's just no other pivots in 3K that you're really looking at. And it allows you to play him at small forward. That feels like a pretty easy decision for me on Bembry. Malachi Flynn, you at least have to think over on FanDuel. 5,100 is not free. We know the kind of ceilings that the position has on FanDuel. Uh, but 3,800 on DK, plugging him alongside with McConnell is going to be very, very popular. But I, I really don't see anybody else in that range that we're really looking at. I mean, look at the difference in projection for a guy like Alex Caruso, who's 3,700. I mean, that's, am I saying that he can't go out and now produce Malachi Flynn? No, but you're basically giving up minutes and just guaranteed locked in usage that you get with Malachi Flynn uh, coming off the bench there or in that starting lineup, getting run either way. Uh, so I, I really like getting to him today. I, I really don't see any way around it. He's as close to a lock as what I will possibly get. I don't like that word, but I'm going to be very, very high on him today. And, and he's going to be in just about everything I do on DK. I think the thing for me with Malachi Flynn is that I don't think the ceiling is going to be quite as high as it was yesterday, just because those offensive stats were such an aberration right. as minutes to kind of seem like an aberration where he was running hot there. They kept him on the court when it seemed like Bembry could have gotten back in at the end of the game. Um, so that would be my one concern. But that said, I agree with you. I do think that Malachi, to me, I have him at a 25 point projection. Also, I was at 24.2 today. And again, those player projections are free. So you can see it all for yourself on the site. Uh, but I think Malachi Flynn, like he opens up everything else. And that's really what it's about on this slate. We're now you have we have some guys we haven't even talked about in much depth yet but Kawhi Leonard and Paul George to me look pretty good against Portland you still have uh the guys we have talked about Zion Williamson you have Karis LeVert you have all these dudes who now you have to pay for I think it makes it a lot easier to pay for them and know that this position is not going to totally kill you so I think Malachi to me even if he doesn't have that tournament winning upside I would agree he's just better to get in lineups than not because he does offer the opportunity to get all these guys you're probably going to need today and if you're on the boom bust tool, you're going to see that they are the two guys with the most negative leverage on this entire slate, Malachi Flynn and DeAndre Bembry. But also take into consideration the boom score. They both have right around 24% or more, 29% for DeAndre Bembry. And I'm just going through other pieces at that position and in that price range, both of them. I mean, I'm not going to play Aaron Baines at 3K, so that doesn't go for Bembry. Troy Brown Jr. Uh, feels impossible to get to now where he was somebody that I, I had targeted as like maybe a low, low owned flyer at 3,100. Um, now that you get Kobe White back in the equation there. Uh, I, I just don't like anything else in any of those price ranges. And if I want to get up to Giannis and be overweight on the field like I want to, if I want to get to some of these centers that are Joel Embiid and Jokic with upside, I don't see any other path to do it other than to play these guys. They've got good enough boom scores where they're hitting their ceiling 25% of the time. I'm happy to take that shot on this slate of being over the overweight to the field and just kind of like living with the result. 
Yeah, I think that's reasonable. Um, if you had to choose one, let's say for some reason you were just you know dead set on not playing both Malachi Flynn and DeAndre Bembry today, uh, which way would you go here? I'm, I'm going to assume based on what you said, it's Flynn's way, but uh, but Bembry, the cheap price tag, that certainly is one thing. We're set it a good amount of times on the channel. It's hard to imagine a 3K guy killing you completely if he's long as he's going to get minutes and be semi-productive. I think it's just a what's your risk adverse uh, profile. I don't even know the right way to say that at the moment. But Malachi Flynn, I think, has uh, a much higher floor than what DeAndre Bembry has in this spot, uh, just because they don't have any other point guard really to to really be turning to. They have guys who can fill in and play a little bit where Bembry's at. Uh, so I would say the floor is higher, but at the same time, you're talking about a 3K player as opposed to a 3,800 player. Uh, that $800 can get used elsewhere in a lineup. Uh, if Malachi Flynn goes for 24, you're probably going to get beat. So there is an argument to be made uh, for, for going to Bembry who could go for 18, 20 and still somehow work out optimally because three K is three K. All right. We're close enough to the halfway point of the show. So I'm going to just very slowly flip my hat to expose the tenderly crafted patent leather and dollar sign here. Cause it's money time guys. Make sure you hit that like button some more. Cause we're giving you guys the top five own plays hot off the presses for DraftKings and FanDuel. This came out just three minutes ago. And as always, you can go to osmo.com slash join, get all the player projections, which are free today. You get them every day for yourself and patches on there. The ownership projections, a boom bust tool that Eric loves here dearly. A lot of our hosts do a great way to reference just what a guy's chances of being an optimal lineup, whether a guy's over-owned. Um, very easy way, especially if you're a person who doesn't have a ton of time on a given day to prepare for slates. Uh, get in there now at osmo.com slash join. Take advantage of all those tools. The top five, though, on DraftKings, number one, Malachi Flynn, of uh, somewhat reasonable, 36%. Number two, TJ McConnell, 35%. Number three, DeAndre Bembry at 31%. Number four, Doug McDermott taking a rise here, 26%. And number five, Miles Turner at 24%. Uh, Eric, I feel like we've talked about all these guys, but I'm going to assume based on what you said, Doug McDermott would be the one you would go the lightest on. Yeah, I think it has to be. I mean, he's just shooting dependent. It's a shooting dependent play who's popular. And obviously there is usage to be had, but uh, you're. I feel like being lighter on a guy who, if he doesn't go out and score 20 real points, is probably going to have a tough time getting there. I mean, look at his steals blocks. Hasn't had more than one in last 15. I, I can't even find anything for him there. Rebounds, not a great rebounder by any means. Doesn't really go in and do any of that dirty work. Has an assist rate that is basically non-existent. I mean, he is a shooting dependent play. So I'm going to be lighter on those kind of guys. As much as I like Doug McDermott as a basketball player, think that he's pretty decent. This is DFS. And, and if I'm taking a one game sample, I feel like taking a lightweight approach to him and, and taking my chances on it feels like the right way to get different on this slate. Yep. I think, I think that's reasonable. And I, you know, it's going to come down, I think, to the ownership for me, but I was getting a lot of McDermott. It will not surprise me if I get a lot less, if he's going to be a top five on play. I just, I think he's fine. I, I think I'm a little more of a believer than Eric is because you know, McDermott has shown the ability to score and get buckets and Chicago's defense does mostly uh, perform not the best, but I agree that I, he does seem to me to be the one out of that top five that probably is worth shaving a little bit of ownership off of on Fandle, the top five, number one, TJ McConnell, 42%. Number two, Miles Turner, 37%. Number three, Mark Marcus Smart at 30%. Number four, Zach Levine at 30%. Number five, Doug McDermott again at a rounded up 30%. Um, Eric, accounting for FanDuel here, uh, we have two guys that I think maybe you might want to punch holes in. And I know Zach Levine was jumping out to you as a guy you wanted to pivot off of earlier. So in this top five of FanDuel where you have McConnell, Turner, Smart, Levine, McDermott, which one stands out to you as being the most over -owned? Um. I mean, I don't think any, I think they're all probably around appropriate to the most part. I mean, we talked about McDermott, so there's that. I think Bembry is probably the guy that I'm the lightest on of this top grouping, just to go down one more, uh, sitting around 29%, 3,700. I know we got to find savings, find savings somewhere, but I just think shooting guard with Smart, Levine, and Levert, uh, I really like getting up to that Levert tag at 8K still. Uh, and I like being over the field. He's only at 15%. I just don't think I want to be spending 3,700. I don't think that I need those savings on this slate. And we'll get to a couple of other guys here as we're going down the line. But, you know, shooting guard is not the best position on this slate by any means. There's nobody that's really like grading out that phenomenally well. And so I see why Bembry is getting that ownership. But we're talking about another 
uh, situation where like, uh, am I going to expect him to go out and just completely, you know, five assists, I feel like is a little bit of an outlier for him. Not a guy who generally uh, spreads the ball around that well. Seven rebounds, is, uh, that's all right for for somebody getting 30 minutes. But I don't know. Coming off of yesterday, uh, I think 3K on DK is a different conversation. I'll get my exposure to him there, and I'll find a different way to capture more upside over on FanDuel. How are you? Let's talk about Boston a little here because I do think Marcus Smart to me looks like a, a solid play on DK. And I'm surprised at how much he's coming up given the value on the slate. But he is sort of a mid priced guy who I think is going to look appealing to optimizers with the projections that are going to be on him today. But are you with him as a popular play on FanDuel? I know you're sort of talking around it there, but on DraftKings, I think he's still going to be in play for me at 5,600. I think the price point works, the 36 minute projection for him works. And um, I, I guess I could mute it a little bit, but on FanDuel, it seems like something where you're competing against other shooting guards who do have really meaningful ceilings. Um, how are you viewing Smart, I guess, relative to DraftKings and FanDuel? I think Smart is one of the best tournament plays on the board on DraftKings. 14% is way, 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 way too low. I'm just going to let that be known. Uh, I With no Evan Fournier, uh, again, that was just a, a new guy inserted into this situation, uh, basically was was going to cap a little bit of the upside but now that he's out of the situation completely today I don't know I I just think that you're right I think he's way too low owned obviously he's getting appropriately owned I think 30 percent on FanDuel uh, which you listed off at the top end that is definitely about appropriate and I'm I'm fine getting a little bit higher on him there but if we're looking at it just in in terms of like if he's going to go off in this spot it's going to be to be assist it's going to be assist it's going to be set up in a number of different ways uh, where he can fill up a box score. I don't know. I just, I think that he fits the profile of somebody I want to be overweight to at 5,600. Tough matchup up against Philly, but I don't know. The total doesn't really show that as much. And I, I like getting there today. Yeah, I, I think we're on the same page there. And on FanDuel, I think maybe a guy you move away from a little bit or at least don't get too above the field there. But DraftKings, close to 15% ownership, not a play that I'm uh, minding too much here. Uh, make sure to stay tuned, by the way, guys, after this, uh, after DraftKings and FanDuel Lock, because we'll be here another half hour. It's a no-house advantage show, but uh, if there's any news that breaks, anything that needs to be talked about, we will be talking about it on here. And honestly, there are ramifications for both no-house advantage and DraftKings and FanDuel for those kind of things. So make sure to hang out with us. We're going the extra half hour today. So uh, hang out on the channel and just, just do whatever do whatever you guys do i don't know <laughs> if you're if you're not if you're hanging out and having a good time at home just keep doing that really be the main thing i would say um what's another team that we haven't hit on for you that jumps out because i have one i want to go to that we've touched on a little bit but i'm willing to uh, let you take the floor here because i know you sometimes have some interesting wrinkles on slates that you want to give to the people i've got an interesting one i've i've got one that i've had targeted for a while and nobody's really talking about it i denver specifically aaron gordon uh, 6,300 over on DraftKings. If we're going to get Jamal Murray off the floor, he's questionable right now. And that news comes out after lock. Aaron Gordon is going to go drastically underowned. drastically. We've seen the last two games, the kind of ceiling that, I mean, it's not even his ceiling. Like, I think that this is a situation, Jamal Murray off the floor, where he's going to do a lot of ball handling duty and he's going to be able to play uh, and, and that assist rate will come up as well. I don't know. I just think 6,300, it's hard to find a ceiling like that on this slate, the way that he's shown out the last two games, much more comfortable in this offense. I don't, I don't really know how to like even quantify that, but all I know is that him and the Denver Nuggets look really, really good. And if you take Murray off that floor, I think people will kind of go towards Jokic in bulk. I would much rather go to, to Aaron Gordon in bulk uh, at a depressed price tag compared to like, we've seen him up over 7K when he was like one of the only guys there in Orlando. I really want to get over top of whatever that number is going to end up. Interesting. I, I do like these guys if Jamal Murray is out. I think the issue that I'm having is that, well, not really an issue because I think I'm going to have enough of the late games here where I'm going to be able to swap around here. And I think this is something that we talked about on a couple of shows today, but yesterday all the games starting at the same time meant that you know, there was basically no way to late swap, though. It was kind of nice to see everything just line up in the right way and you knew where you stood within the that first run of games. But today you actually can late swap. So if you're getting exposure to, like for me, I'm going to have a lot of Clippers guys. I'm not too worried about any injury that's going to come because of the fact that Kawhi Leonard, Paul George take up a lot of salary even Zubach is popping up for me um I think there's gonna be a lot of ways to swap around here so maybe you, you can force in those guys from the late slate if you want to try to have some ways to pivot around but um I, for me it's occurring enough naturally that it's not a concern actually I guess Eric for you quick thought on that how are you handling it in terms of just how you're preparing for the idea that maybe Murray won't be in because I know you are a, one of our our swap optimizer gurus on here 
Yeah, well, well, gee, thank you so much. Yeah, basically a young Alex Baker uh, before his prime. <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, I absolutely love uh, the idea. That's kind of part of why I don't want to play a 4100 or a 4K Doug McDermott today. I don't really want to do that and lock him in at a spot where I can't have access to some higher paced matchups. we got the two highest totals in the nightcap at 10 p.m. Eastern, uh, 7 p.m. out here on the West Coast. Why do I not want to really try to mix and match some of my good lineups? Now, let's say Doug McDermott goes for 35. I can still pivot around and try to capture that kind of upside in a different way. But if I lock him in and he puts up 18, you're dead. So I pretty much kind of opening up just in case there's something also that breaks. We see it all the time and specifically with the Clippers. It happens every single day where something wonky ends up showing up. Give yourself as much of an opportunity to swap into the nuts as possible. Like, don't give yourself no outs. And, and that's kind of what you do when you use up a lineup spot in these early games. I say that full knowing full well that Karis Levert, if he doesn't go for a ceiling game, I can do things to try to get those lineups back. But for a young or for a cheap piece like Doug McDermott, who's kind of in that weird range, he's not 3K, he's not 5,500 with, you know, other ancillary stats that he's going to pick up. I'm going to kind of just be light on him simply so I can adjust to that news. And specifically for me, I really want to try to see how much Aaron, Aaron Gordon I can get to compared to the field uh, in a night game where if that news breaks late, we could be looking at a great spot. And now the other piece of news that I was going to bring up just broke Brandon Clark's out. Uh, and that was oh. the one that I really was kind of narrowed in on for Memphis. Uh, it's not a game environment that anybody was really going to kind of be looking at, but I did have some interest uh, on taking like the odd shots on Jonas Valanciunas on some of these other bigs. Like, I don't think Xavier Tillman's really kind of the direction I want to go to, but uh, Kyle Anderson is like a different human being this year. I don't even know how to quantify it, but 5,400 over on DraftKings, we, we know the kind of ceiling that can exist there. And now you're opening more minutes at the three and the four uh, with Brandon Clark out of there. Jonas Valanciunas, I think we see a little bit more secure run. Curious what his ownership would get to, but on a two on a two center slate, uh, two center site like DraftKings, 7,400 is just too cheap. And 7,600 on FanDuel, I think the ceiling is still there. Yeah, no, I think that actually could be one that changes things around because I had some guys here projected to be pretty decent values. And I have to assume I'm um, having Brandon Clark out there with a good amount of usage for him, 18% on the year rebounds at a decent clip as well. Um, could open some things up a little more here. So we'll see what the uh, the awesome projections say on that. And of course, check them out yourself on the site. Uh, make sure you're clearing your cash too if you're seeing guys who aren't in. But uh, guys who are injured or out, whatever, are just going to be zeros on there. So for some reason you're confused by that, just keep that in mind on there. Uh, so some people in YouTube chat talking about that. Um, let's take some questions from the Slack real fast here because I think we have a couple built up. Um, let's see. We got. What was your team? I I, I don't want to be oh, yeah. inconsiderate. What was your team that you had your eye on? Uh, so for me, it's the Lakers, and I think this is maybe not a super surprising one given the fact that you know having no Drummond in there, I think this game was to me sort of priced for the return of Drummond, or at least that's what it appeared to me. But Kyle Kuzma is a play that I think I'm baffled by how much I'm going to get today, but I am <laughs> going to roll with it because. How does that feel? It's not the best, Eric. I think we all know that about Kyle Kuzma, but a depleted Toronto team. I feel like this is a spot where I don't mind going to him here. Again, no Andre Drummond in there, still no LeBron, still no AD. But I think getting more Schroeder, getting more Kuzma, I didn't get as much Harrell as I would have thought, which kind of bubs me out because I thought he was a player that was going to naturally bubble up a bit more. But you still do have Gasol playing more minutes recently and playing a little more effectively recently. So maybe that's not the worst thing. But the Kuzma to me, yeah, took a gigantic jump upwards today in a way that I'm emotionally not prepared to go down with the Kuzma ship today. Yeah, neither am I, because uh, I, I, that's why I'm not doing it as much uh, <laughs> by any means, because I don't think I would be able to recover from deciding randomly at 6,800 or what is he over on FanDuel? He's 74, right? Isn't that like 7,400 on FanDuel? Oh yeah. I, I don't know. I think Markeith Morris, not at 5k over on FanDuel, but I, I did already have some Markeith interest, uh, 5k on DraftKings where there might be a little bit of a double, double situation where if they go smaller, uh, can kind of like make that work a little bit. Oh yeah. No, Harold, Harold's somebody that I'm auspiciously low on considering the Drummond is out. So I, I think that that's actually a good point of reference. 6,800 on FanDuel. I'm not going to get to him there. 6,100 on a two center site. I'm going to get to, I think. Eric, here's something I'm not sure you've had on one of your shows yet, but you're going to get to see it live today uh, because we do not respond well to fake news in the YouTube chat, and we do not take kindly to, to the YouTube player injury terrorism <laughs> in our channels, and we are fighting back here. So, Kobe Gettled, you are putting time out now for saying TJ McConnell's out. Don't besmirch people out there. Don't confuse them. And if he ends up coming back in or if he ends up being rolled out, then I will. Uh, you'll be back in by that point anyway. But, yeah, no fake news. It's, <laughs> it's a community. You're all trying to win 
win together. You're not trying to screw people over, screw over another 3,000 people who are just trying to be smart like you are. Don't be a dick. Kobe with a K and a Y. What kind of name is that? It's not even oh, you mean like the most famous name no, with possible a y. in with LA? A oh, with a Y. Okay, yeah. never mind. Yeah, got it. <laughs> different. That's different. But yeah, that is uh, yeah, no, no fake news in here. And if it's accidental, then you know you'll, you'll you can come back in five minutes. But I'll never forgive you, Kobe. With a Y, <laughs> that much is for sure. Um, let's go. Let's go to one team that we haven't hit on at all, and I think is interesting, particularly on Fanduel. We mentioned him as one of the chalk plays, Zach Levine for Chicago. Uh, not a great spot against Indiana, but it does seem like the Bulls project pretty well today. I feel like Vooch and Levine on DraftKings look like solid plays to me. That's sort of where it ends, though. But uh, we also have that young kind of I don't know why getting eighteen. Uh, Eighteen percent ownership or so. I guess. Welcome to the club. I was so confused by that yeah. at first, but I think it does make sense. And he's somebody that I was having a lot of on the rise up of that up the scale, like when he was playing backup and mm-hmm. kind of getting in there and playing efficient numbers. The problem is that that minutes floor can just drop instantly. But they have definitely shown a propensity to give him more extended run and not Laurie Markinen. Uh, let that be known for whatever reason. I I think they're just kind of over Laurie. I think he's going to be gone at the end of the year anyway. They didn't trade him at the deadline. And so it's going to be kind of Thad Young in there. Uh, I, I We've seen him get on top of some usage, 25.8, 28% usage, 25.3% usage the last three times out. The problem is he's playing alongside Vooch and Levine, and that just makes it difficult to imagine that he can really get there in a meaningful way. But this Pacers team doesn't have Sabonis. It's going to be pretty thin uh, defensively outside of Turner, who will be on Vooch. And not to talk about individual matchups, but uh, this this game does have a, a higher total than what I was expecting. So I, I don't mind the play. I was just very concerned that it was as high of a number as what it was. Yeah, I didn't get it today looking at it this morning. I honestly still don't get how people are getting there now, I guess, unless you're just running your your minutes projection against how many uh, his fantasy points per minute on the year, which mm-hmm. has been a lot better than people may realize, because I remember there was a debate we had on this show, and our old pal, the Chubster Josh Edelman, always known for his way of, of peeing on anybody's parades whenever there is one that's going down the street, uh, pointing out that Thaddeus Young wasn't that good or whatever when he was on that stretch that Eric was talking about, playing backup center, playing a meaningfully different role. Like, he's been just good in every spot they put him in, that said, like he's been a 1.2 fantasy point per minute guy. I've been for 0.97 today, and I don't really know like why that is and why he's taking such a drop down. I guess Vooch's existence to me uh, and how I do my projections, I guess, would make Vooch that existing. <laughs> he's a person in the world. How dare he breathe our air? God, well, Vooch. I think he makes Thaddeus Young questionable chalk to me. And if he goes off today, then I'll, I'll take the L on this one. But I just I don't see how people are getting there at that much volume. I could see getting him a little, but almost 20% seems crazy to me. Um, let's see here. Any other, let's go back to the premium slack for some questions. We'll talk more about any, any plays that we haven't hit on that we think is important. And again, we are going an extra half hour today. Thanks to our friends at no house advantage. We're going to show you some optimal lineups, going to show you guys the optimal lineups page for no house advantage too, which you could basically just pull in and make your own lineups. You don't even have to do anything really just take them straight from awesome himself. So we'll talk about that coming up in a little bit here. Uh, some of the questions building up the premium slack. Uh, let's see. Grant or Thad on a FanDuel single entry for Christian, I would say neither for me. Can we talk about one guy from Detroit that nobody's talking about in Sadiq Bay, who's a rookie mm. who has minutes volatility and points volatility, who's going like 1% owned today? Why is nobody playing a like low 4K Sadiq Bay? Can somebody explain that to me? I think that that, not to completely piggyback and change the question, but like I'm pretty sure that Sadiq Bay is probably one of the most under-owned dudes on this slate and now you're taking Killian Hayes who just got reemerged but like Sadiq Bay was like up in the mid fives the situation really hasn't changed it doesn't affect his position having 48 guards there so why are we not playing Sadiq Bay today and I know he doesn't project well but most guys who have this kind of minutes volatility and usage volatility are going to be priced differently uh what do you think about that I am not as big on Sadiq Bay today although I could see with that price on I think you said this vandal price is 4k well, on DK, he's 4,300 was what I was looking at. Oh, okay. and I know yeah. he doesn't project well, like, at all. But mm-hmm. would it surprise you if he got extended run? We've seen some some massive spikes. I'm not talking about the 54.5 necessarily for Toronto, but multiple games over 30. He's in that same price range as McDermott. Uh, I don't know. I just think that if you told me, like, Sadiq Bay outperformed Doug McDermott at 4%, 5%, I wouldn't be shocked. 
I, I get it. I think that's if you're looking through it, at it through that prism of, hey, he's a pivot to a guy who's going to be pretty decently owned. I could see getting there. I think to me, and based on my sword, I did get a lot less Doug McDermott. So the, the theories that we had as we talked through that ended up being true for me. Like I'd rather go to a Josh Jackson. I'd rather go. I think Mason Plumley is actually a decent play at center, yeah, though. You I are agree. giving away a revenge spot. narrative. Yeah. 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 Sure. You could you could sprinkle that into. Um, I, yeah, I think that there are better plays for me in Detroit, but I get it. I, I think where you're saying with the price point and the fact that, yeah, he's going to be a direct pivot to a very chalky guy. Like if you can get Sadiq Bay into a lineup where you love it, but it has Doug McDermott in there and you have the money left over to, to make that swap. I think that to me is the play, but on a projection basis, a median projection basis, I just don't know that his like 21 fantasy points also has been for under 20. Like that's not a great number there, but I think oh, a tournament yeah, play no, for sure. It's, he's going to project horribly, but <laughs> I don't like that's that's also the other thing about it. Like we we got to be project guys for their medium output, but like I I think that there's a minutes upside and there's obviously a usage upside for him as well. We've seen it multiple times this year. I I don't know. I think he's a little underrepresented. All right, let's take some more questions from the Slack here. And of course, that premium Slack is part of an Osmo Plus membership. I think every single package we have on there, even the cheaper ones, the Express packages on there, we get the projections and the ownership projections in grade form. Uh, that includes the premium Slack. Premium Slack, a great place to be. If you are a person in the YouTube chat, you just like talking about DFS. There are people talking about DFS and betting in every single sport, literally all hours of the day. And that is part of the, the fun that you have. You're joining the community. You're joining the family. So go to Osmo.com slash join. Check out all the packages that are going on there. And again, even those Express packages will get Give you access to the premium slack um so you got archuleta text tag me and something oh he plays a lot of tears on dk who do you think has a better game vooch or zion eric we are men of the people and even if you're playing tears you want to answer your question so vooch or zion for you for for the tears and archuleta uh archuleta 22 play more than one lineup and uh play a little bit of both because they're projected within a point for each other if i take one i'll probably go zion because i think he probably goes a little bit under owned compared to vooch considering that news came out 45 minutes before lock. I've got Zion at 47.8 and Vooch at 45.5. So I'll say lock Zion in and your DK tiers today. That's oh, <laughs> look at you. You're you're a positive affirmation guy. I well, like here's you. the thing. I, I normally, we don't like to talk about locks if sometimes they happen, but uh, in tiers, I will absolutely just say locks left and right. Cause I don't know. Like I'm not playing. <laughs> Cause it's, it's two guys and there's like five guys at the position period. So it makes sense. <laughs> your your outs are thin. Like uh, your paths to failure are thin. Yeah, I agree. Um, Iron Maiden 2 asking thoughts on Vooch for DK single entry. I have no issue with it. I think um, I might still be more inclined to go Miles Turner's way personally, but I do think Vooch, uh, one of my better projected center plays on the slate. So I really have no issue with it, I guess, other than maybe some opportunity cost. Yep, same. Um, other questions on the premium slack. Just going to burn through them all pretty fast. Mr. Moneybags, my my friend and money always. Vooch and Caruso or Robert Williams is smart for a DK GPP. I don't think Caruso is a factor at all for me. It's got to be Williams and Smart. Fact, yeah. I heard Caruso and you lost me. He's, uh, I, I love the boss man, good dude, but uh, can't, can't do it. He's, he's too busy building DFS lineups to, to put up forty tonight. Awesome, yo. Any thoughts on Blazers who are not Damon CJ like Covington, Mello, or Norman Powell? I don't know that I got much of Portland, which kind of sucks because I have a lot of Clippers to talk about here. But yeah, I didn't get a single share of, of a single Blazers player. I have a little bit of McCollum on FanDuel. It's a product of shooting guard being shooting guard, uh, but I have none on DK. I have a little bit more Covington, I think, uh, than the field over on DK. FanDuel, uh, don't really want to go crazy at 6,300, but uh he just projects out poorly but i think that there is an opportunity if they do go slow which the clippers also like to do in a lot of situations where they put morris at the five you could end up seeing this game just really really pace up with zubats and uh canter off the floor so i think there is an outside chance for both morris and for covington to outperform uh their expectation but not in a meaningful way where i'm like hey i need to prioritize them in lineups it's more of like they're sprinkled in my 150 on each side the cancer to me projects is the only one that's usable, but I, I, again, I prefer Miles Turner. So I think I wouldn't have a ton of interest here, but I think for tournaments, you know, certainly not the worst thing. And I, I feel like Dame would be the one I'd be willing to take some flyers on for tournaments okay. on DK, at least the AK yeah, price tag for McCollum is ugly. If you try to make an argument against his ceiling, you're crazy. So it's just yeah. kind of that. But for me, I think a lot of those targets are becoming Steph Curry shares. Uh, I, I just think Steph has a little bit higher ceiling yeah, in his spot. Uh, let's see other questions here from Shrick Stein asking favorite point guard and shooting guard under or point guard or shooting guard under 4,800 on DK. Uh, uh, Malachi see. Flynn. 
Oh yeah. Well, I, well, I mean, that's stuff, like I legitimately think. the easiest call ever on that shooting guard under 4,800. Uh, God, it takes a while for me to get down. I mean, I don't have like anybody around 4,800. I have a little, Justin and holiday is, uh, like I'm getting like 3% of, but yeah, I, I'm not getting any shooting guards in that range on DK. None. Yeah. For me, it is, yeah, it's also Malachi Flynn and, um, yeah. And memory is a small forward. So that doesn't matter. Yeah. Just Malachi Flynn. I think is the only one I'm getting any sort of amount of, um, other questions in the premium slack DK priest asking Pascal and Justin holiday or Leonard and Tillman for a FanDuel GPP. I guess it's worth saying for Memphis, uh, Osmo did update the minutes projections and now all these guys look usable to me, but in a way where I don't even want to recrunch it because I'm afraid I'm going to get too much of a random guy on Memphis. And it's not a great spot against no, Miami. No, 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 no. You will recrunch it because you have forever. This no. is, that's so I, I got 12% say. Grayson Allen already before Why this would, news. No, 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 no. You, I mean, go ahead and cap him. But what I'm saying is that there's only one game locking at seven. You're not hurting anything by recrunching now. You're going to be recrunching a bunch afterwards, I would hope anyway. So it doesn't really change anything. I would rather have, I mean, you're basically saying, I don't want to use the most updated information to make correct lineups. You're right, but I do think sometimes with certain teams who run deeper that it does end up getting a little bit weird when you lose a guy with a like Clark who does a little bit of everything. Like that's my concern for just my process okay. is that I don't want to lose that degree of control with it. And um, and there's just enough time on the show to get it out there. But you're right, you should crunch for it. And I just have to say, like, I just think all these guys look better. But to me, when all the guys look better, that's a sign it's like maybe nobody looks better. And that's sort of my concern with the median projection, how you view that. Yeah, if you have no good or if you have 15 good plays you have no good plays <laughs> right i'm like an old school football coach i'm just chopping exactly. off Memphis yeah. Grizzlies you've got left four right. quarterbacks you've got zero <laughs> um paul george okay for cash devious ass for dk cash in particular um let's see I, he's owned pretty well yeah he's he's I not mind I, yeah he's not bad he's not an ideal cash game play but if you haven't projected well I, I don't mind it but he's not like a high owned guy who's got a pretty good floor and ceiling so i think that's that is the correct way to put it he is fine as a last i don't know how you would have him at that price range the last guy in mm. but i think in this scenario that that does make sense where uh if you're plugging in a lot of this value malachi i think your first your first couple guys in in cash are all pretty cheap uh it's like turner who's not expensive in the mid-range of center uh, it's going to be uh, both of the Raptors pieces of value. And then, you know, building from those three off of that. Yeah. You could probably end up in that 8k range. Yeah. So Paul George is fine. is the last guy in. Yeah. Paul George, honestly, not that far out of the top eight owned guys on, on DraftKings right now. So I, I guess it's not that bad. He seems a little lower owned than I would have expected, you know, for a cash game, but like, it doesn't honestly, feel right clicking Paul George with Kawhi Leonard in. It just doesn't yeah. feel right to me, but it's probably correct. I'm getting both on both of those guys today at pretty good volume, but honestly, the top eight on guys on DraftKings right now, like this to me is the cash game lineup and I, uh, we're, we're almost locked anyway. So I'll just, I'll just read it out. But like Malachi Flynn, McConnell, Bembry, McDermott, Kuzma, Lavert, Turner. Like I, that to me is like basically the shell of the cash game lineup and just put in whatever else works with that salary. But those are all guys who are going to be owned who are in decent spots who are going to be benefiting from situations. Like I think today should be, I, it's, I don't play cash every day. So that's, I'm, I'm probably making a proclamation. I can't back up, but it seems like it should be an easy cash game today, really. <laughs> if I had you to, would think, you would think it kind of just fits together. Yeah, um, I would. You'd think, and of course that means. It but then it becomes a two v two that we end up losing all our money on. So that's why <laughs> exactly. I don't play cash. Uh, Zion and Aaron Gordon or Siakam and Kuzma on DK for TRD in the premium slack. I heard Aaron Gordon, so just yeah. like sign me up. Yeah, Zion and Aaron Gordon. It seems to be Eric's pick. I would go Siakam and Kuzma, though. I think if Murray gets ruled out, like Eric was talking about earlier, I think that does become Zion and Gordon for me. I do like Siakam a lot too. I mean, he's gonna go a little bit lower on than. Imagine a world where Pascal Siakam went for fifty yesterday. Just imagine a world where I would Pascal like to. went for fifty. Yeah, and me too. It would be a beautiful <laughs> world. But also, what would his ownership be coming off of a fifty-point outing? I would say double where it is. That's mm -hmm. why I'm double the field on Pascal Siakam today. Yeah, if, if Siakam and uh, DeMar DeRozan, if DeMar DeRozan hadn't gotten blown out by the Cavaliers yesterday, it would have been a much better day for me. I, But when you lose a slate on guys like Siakam and DeRozan who are benefiting from you know guys being out, like I think you just got to take that and it's going to work out in your favor more than not. Uh, let's see. No, no other questions in the premium slack. I don't think I missed any super chats. Any final thoughts on them? Oh, I missed one here from uh, Soul Dope1234, FanDuel, Flynn, Levine, and Williams, or Curry, Bembry, and Bay. Uh, Eric, how are you feeling about that one for FanDuel? Curry, Bembry, Bay. I mean, I like 
I like that quite a bit. Curry, Ben, Marie Bay. I didn't hear the complete, but what was the first one? Flynn, one Levine, and Williams, I think I prefer a little bit more. Flynn, Levine, Williams. I mean, yeah, it's the a first one is one. much more security. There's yeah. much more security, but I like, in tournaments, I like the second one. If you're making like one lineup. And shout out Kiernan Doyle joining Team Osmo. We appreciate everybody here who's joining and Thanks, lots of man. cool stuff going with that stuff. I'll spare you guys a spiel so we can take a few more questions, but check the join button out underneath the video if you are on desktop YouTube right now. I'm just making sure I don't, I don't think I missed any other super chats, but. Also, can we talk about Draymond Green for one second too? Because yeah, he's a guy that I'm very, very high on, but we haven't brought up whatsoever. Uh, 6,700 fast paced game, got Steph Curry playing alongside him again. We know that he can kind of start spiking it in that way. Golden State needs to start winning games. They're 10th in the West. If they're going to start winning games, it's going to be Steph and it's going to be Draymond that help them do that. This is a this is a tough matchup, obviously, but I think that there is just with the, I mean, it's not even coach speak, it's Steph Curry speak surrounding this team right now. I like getting to a lot of Steph and Draymond tonight. Plus, if news breaks, you've got two guys that I think allow you to swap onto other pieces. And so having some of that salary built up in that last game is not the worst idea. Yeah, Steph, to me, I, I think Steph rarely projects super well for me, but today is one of those days that I think he looks like a pretty solid play, even at the elevated price tag. So I definitely I'm gonna have a good amount of Steph Curry, a little bit less than the field it looks like on DK, but still we'll have enough that I don't think I'll be totally uh, crestfallen if he goes off today. Uh, we got one minute left to lock, guys, so get those lineups in. By the time you hear this, we probably are pretty close to lock. Any final observations you have, Eric? Obviously, things could change again with swap optimizing and the news that's going to come out over the course of this next half hour that we're going to still be on the show for. But any final things you want to bring to the people here that you may have observed in your crunches or whatever process? Yeah, I'm getting, you know, over 35% Siakam and Gordon. Uh, those are kind of my tournament stands. Uh, Williamson right there at 35%. I think I'll be over the field there. Power forward's kind of been turned into a, a spend up position for me on both sites. So I thought that that was kind of interesting because I thought it was kind of a position I was going to be pump punting coming into today. Um, but that's just kind of how DFS works. You kind of switch up your process based on where the value exists. I think it exists at the small forward position with Bembry, with Flynn, uh, with TJ McConnell. So I think that that's kind of building up a lot of my, my ownership for, for my punts. And so power forward allows me to spend a little bit of money. Oh, Arkathel, we missed one super chat here. Is James Johnson still in play on DK? Um, wait, what? Uh, let me see. I don't know. Oh, pulled up the wrong team. That's why. Um, I don't think he got much of a minute jump from Osmo and on DK is 5,100. I guess he's looks on the cusp of playable to me, but 26 minute projection. I don't have the most confidence. I think he was mostly benefiting from there just being nobody having Zion. in. I think everything's going to go to Zion. Yeah. If we had gotten Adams out, I think that that would have been interesting too. Uh, just in terms of him playing the four, possibly uh, playing alongside Hayes or some of these other guys where he could have still gotten some rebounds. I just don't see a ton of upside for him at 5,200 because Zion's basically a, a direct swap on him in the starting lineup. I'd, I would be surprised if James Johnson uh, slotted alongside him, but I guess if you're, if you're going to see that starting lineup and he's in it, I would probably give him a little boost and I'd have more than the 2% I have now. All right, we are locked on DraftKings and FanDuel. So uh, hang out with us, though, here another half hour. We're going we're gonna to talk about any news that breaks, as we always do here, in addition to building some No House Advantage lineups. And honestly, this is something, too, which I, I obviously we've done reads for No House Advantage for a while. They've been a sponsor since I've been back at Osmo. And I feel like it's something that honestly wasn't fully sinking into me until we were doing the tip off every day that it's very easy to build good lineups at no house advantage, whether you're using the no house advantage optimal lineups page here uh, that we have available to you guys on the top tab under the NBA. Uh, but also if you're just honestly looking at the projections page, just seeing those guys, seeing the lines not move because of guys being rolled in or out in this time in NBA, Eric, and I'm, I think you're going to be on the same page here. Like this is the best time to play no house advantage because the lines are just not accurate. And it's, it's not a bad thing. Like I know people sometimes go into, House advantage go like this isn't what the sports book had it is, and that's a good thing for you guys out there. It's an over under game, so if it's not where the sports book is, then just guess it's where the sports book is, and you can go over under very easily. But like, it's honestly a very good time to play no house advantage. That's not even an ad read, this is just me observing it and being like, I should be playing more on no house advantage instead of just chasing the, the DraftKings and Fandle Dragon every night. And I would say this is the case with, with no house advantage, Eric. Just give me your thoughts real fast because I know we have some people here who haven't played, and I haven't done a sponsored show in a while, so I want to make sure that we're giving everybody everything we can. Well, Spags, you teach what you need to learn yourself. That's kind of how life works. And so you're teaching yourself how to make money by going over to NHA, talking everybody through it, because it truly is 
one of the best sites to go. Uh, I, I love going over there and playing. It seems like I'm pretty profitable and I, I just kind of enjoy uh, being able to, to not necessarily hedge some of the props, but it makes for a good addition uh, to my DFS action in a given night. Like tonight, there's one just guaranteed lock on the board for the most part, unless you were to have like 14 injuries happen. Uh, Kendrick Nunn, the under of everything that we're looking at in that direction, Kendrick Nunn's basically going to be out of the rotation completely, uh, going to be probably the best spot on the board. There are going to be people who do not play Kendrick Nunn in the 10 confidence point slot. Anybody who doesn't do that, I guarantee you, anybody, it's going to be paying the rake. So you're looking at a situation right off the bat where Kendrick Nunn's somebody that we haven't even said his name one time, but he matters so much on this slate because taking the under of him, uh, specifically, I like doing the points, rebounds, assists, because I think it just, in the event that he were to somehow get on the court in like garbage time or do whatever else, it makes it a little bit larger number. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to go on that side of it. I think that that gives me more outs. Or you could just say points, because like even in garbage time, uh, is he going to get up to 13.5 real points as opposed to maybe getting some random rebounds? Any, any direction you want to go with Kendrick Nunn is a fine direction by me. Yeah, and that's one of those things that we're talking about. I think it honestly is the best case study here to point to where, you know, this is a guy who Kendrick Nunn, honestly, I think the line is actually reflecting here where they think it would be in a normal situation where you had even Tyler Hero, Goran Dragic, Jimmy Butler all available. And those guys have not been all available at once. But now you also have Oladipo. So that line is actually probably correct for what it would have been a couple weeks ago. But it's not correct for the situation now, which is that Nunn was available last game and didn't even play. And I think that's something that could happen again. I guess the one caveat, and this might be a question for our friends at no house advantage i think if the guy's available you could still get a zero and if he doesn't log any minutes i think you're okay but i think that's one thing that if, if our that's 100 okay. correct yeah if they're okay. active you can take the under and they're and then that prop is live okay. it's not like baseball where somebody has to start in order for the bet to be valid you know they can't be somebody who comes in in relief you have to have the exact starter be the pitcher in this mm -hmm. situation if they are on the active roster if they are not ruled out before the game uh, they are active. And if they get ruled out, like, let's say, uh, once the game starts, you're fine too, like in a Paul George situation. But it can't yeah. be something that you're literally taking advantage of the news and they end up getting a zero because they were ruled out half an hour before you'd get a zero in that situation. So okay, that's that's what that. I thought. But I, I wanted to make sure before I was like, yeah, go ahead, because if Kendrick Dunn doesn't yeah. play. Uh, but yeah, that does seem like it, he's going to be available. He was active last game. Um, so yeah, just take the 100% confidence here from Osmo. And that's probably your 10 or nine pointer here, but probably the 10 pointer here. I think it's a nine pointer mm -hmm. if you want to be a hero and, and get different here um some other guys took jumps upwards on no house advantage which i think is interesting and um john morant i think went up a little because of brandon clark being out in a way that's interesting he's now 80 actually no he went down um 87 chance of hitting the under on his assists i don't know that i have the highest confidence but eric let's talk about some of the best under ones and i guess you can give me what you mm -hmm. feel the best about because i think we're in agreement here that none should be the 10 or 9 pointer here and maybe we could find at least a 9 or an 8 or a 7 mm -hmm. amidst these but jalen brown the under on his three pointers made 93 percent chance of hitting according to osmo clint capella 91 percent chance of hitting the under on his rebounds today maybe a bit surprising for some people out there but that's the number that's in john moran under eight and a half assists 87 percent chance um, a couple other ones here too damian lillard and kemba walker's assist number do any of those jump out to you as being like, hey, I feel really good about this one for whatever reason? I do feel good about the Clint Capella one. And it's more of a minutes thing because we've seen him have some gaudy rebound numbers uh, here of late with John Collins off the floor. And I think we were seeing them with John Collins on the floor. 16 and a half is just a large, large number. And you're it, it's not a 50-50 kind of outcome. I mean, you're seeing it right there on the on the projections that this is something where in a in a game where this plays out. 10 times he gets, he doesn't hit 16 and a half. He doesn't hit 17, which is the number he has to reach nine out of 10. So like, I love going to Clint Capella there. Jalen Brown, we could see him spike it, but uh, I, I think maybe with Evan and Fournier out, uh, I would maybe lean on that being maybe a tiny bit lower than the Clint Capella one. Uh, I know that they both project out phenomenally well, and I do like the under, but I think I still like that Capella one, maybe a tiny bit more. Yeah, I'm with you on the Capella one. Somebody was asking earlier about Capella being a good play today or not. And um, I think he was asking if Capella or Embiid, it was a neither play really jumped out enough, I think. And ownership wise, don't seem they'll be highly owned that we could take it during the show. So my bad to that guy on YouTube who was honestly spamming it. So I guess I don't feel that bad. But Clay Capella, <laughs> the fact that you have Okongwu getting minutes now meaningfully behind him scares me away from Capella, where I have Capella having the most rebounds of anybody on the board tonight at 13.6. 
that's still three rebounds short of this line. I just don't get where the line came from. I guess maybe they were looking at a longer term minutes projection where Capella was getting up to high thirties minutes, but if Okongu is going to be in for 19 minutes from Osmo today, I'm with, I'm with you. I think Capella to me, the under on the rebounds that feels maybe more like an eight pointer, but I think it's the nine or eight pointer and probably a lot of lineups. Yeah. And we know that no house advantage isn't putting a line out there to like really like play with you. Like the maybe yeah. Vegas sometimes when you're like, Ooh, I want to take advantage of this because for them it's, it's not, it doesn't matter. It's not like uh, they're paying out based on whether you hit over or under what it comes in on. You're playing peer to peer. So uh, let that be known that it's still a, a situation where you could be looking at um, you could be looking at getting an advantage just by being on the right side of it. You got 23 minutes left to lock a no house advantage. And it looks like their uh, slam dunk today, which has 10 K guaranteed five K to first place, only 61% full. So there is a chance there could be some overlay here. Also a lot of ways for you guys to make quality lineups. Even if you don't want to do a, a second of work here, where you did your fantasy crunch lineups for the day for draftings and Fandle, you don't even want to look at it. You can go to the optimal lineups page that we have on the NBA tab uh, on Osmo.com. And you can see here, um, if you go to any, uh, where is it? The NHA, uh, actually Jordan's, I think pulling this up too at the same time and no house advantage there and then nha nba optimal lineups there was too many acronyms and my brain was just like <laughs> nha nba what <laughs> like, don't go to the I AA saw it happen in real time you don't need to tell me <laughs> the nha nba optimal lineups though that page that exists actually i'll drop the link in chat so you guys can see it uh, these are free and you can literally just export these or you can hand answer them yourself too if you want but the lines have been made for you so you don't have to do any guesswork and i'm just dropping a link in the chat now but there, there that is for you guys. So make sure to check that page out, the Optimal Lineups page for No House Advantage because it's about as simple as you can get to make some money on there. Uh, but let's keep going through some of these props. And one that I think actually would be my nine-pointer today, uh, since we sort of debated that, Kyle Kuzma's rebounds uh, is one that I like a lot today. I mentioned I'm a big fan of Kyle Kuzma. I guess with the amount of Kyle Kuzma that I played, you can make an argument that maybe I should take the under on all his props and No House Advantage. <laughs> but I'm a fool who just wants to show my Kyle Kuzma love for everybody today. And I think in this spot, Eric, we've got a – Let's see. Let me just refresh this the over odds on Kuzma 98.6% chance of hitting his 5.5 rebounds. Osmo has him getting double digit rebounds today. You could also do the points and rebounds prop, which has slightly lower odds, but, but still kind of a similar composition there. A line of 21.5 Osmo has it for 29.3 and an 87% chance of hitting. But are you with me at least on, on this site, on the no house advantage site that Kyle Kuzma is a good play as a nine pointer on no house advantage. I didn't poo poo it. I didn't say he was a terrible player. You poo pooed all over him. You know you uh, did. Okay, I did not. That would be weird. Uh, I'm pretty sure I'd like the I like the over as well on those. I mean, you're looking at almost double the rebound expectation for him there. That's a large, large number on NHA. It's rare that you see numbers with 98, 100, uh, unless somebody's ruled out, in which case don't play them anyway. But uh, it's very rare on the projections page that you're going to see this big of a number. So Kyle uh, Kyle Kuzma is definitely going to get plugged in. I think the like 1.4% would be him like tweaking an ankle or a blowout. Uh, that would have to be like a ridiculous blowout where he didn't get any third quarter run because no Drummond in there, uh, no AD, no LeBron. Kyle Kuzma going to be rebounding the ball. Yeah, that is really one thing that uh, I think, thankfully for Lakers fans, he figured out that he had to do something besides just put up shots over and over again and has been rebounding at a pretty good rate this year. Uh, those numbers take a bit of a jump upwards as well in court time without LeBron and AD. I'm um, actually just going to scroll over to his rates real fast. But uh, for Kyle Kuzma, about a 13.7% rebound rate in court time uh, without LeBron and AD, which is a, a minor uptick on a season average, but still enough there. The usage as well, if you want to go with the points and rebounds prop, gets up to 22.5% for him um, and honestly can be high or two in certain pot in certain spots so i think kuzma to me a uh, good dfs play but a no house advantage play i think you'd have a hard time arguing even if you hate kyle kuzma um other top plays this is a weird one but i think this is one of those <laughs> ones too with osmo and you might be looking at the same one duncan robinson's rebounds prop being the over 2.5 73 chance of hitting I don't have the most confidence in this one, Eric, but I feel like this is probably a six or five pointer, but interesting one that wouldn't occur for me in, in any way. And I think that seems like a core building block for your no house advantage lineups. So let's just look at this. Like what has he been playing for minutes in the last couple is kind of the question. Cause if he's on the floor, you can run into two rebounds on accident. Like you and I could play in an NBA game and get a rebound just by happenstance of the ball bouncing your direction. And uh, not saying that we're, we'd be even remotely capable of playing well in that kind of a situation, but. Oh, you know, I got 20 Robinson's points, in, 10 boards. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm a double, <laughs> double machine. You know, I, South Dakota. Yeah. We had the same level of competition as Southern California. Let me tell you, but yeah, I like, 
I like going to a guy who's playing 36 minutes, third 29 minutes, starting in there at the three. Like I, I like Duncan Robinson just to like run into some rebounds. Why not? Yeah, he's on the floor enough. Awesome has him for 30 minutes. I have him projected with those 30 minutes for 3.4 rebounds. Uh, that number to me feels fine. It's not a sexy pick, but it is one that, you know, it's kind of to me like the equivalent of a mid-tier play on DraftKings where it's like, oh yeah, maybe like Marcus Smart today. Marcus Smart is 5,600 on DK. Like this is Marcus Smart today is where it's like, oh, it doesn't make sense why Marcus Smart is popping up this much, but the numbers say what they say and it does look like a better play. I think that's what Duncan Robinson is for me. Uh, this rebounds prop is one that is pretty solid right now. And, uh, you know, I think not going to get much worse one that could get better though. And this is your guy, Aaron Gordon already a 71% chance of hitting the over on his points and assists at a 15.5 line. And that's one that I think, you know, if we know the news, you're probably not going to know it here in the next 15 minutes. But if you want to take the chance here that Jamal Murray doesn't play that line gets, I think to probably a 90% chance of hitting the over um, if Jamal Murray is out, but how are you feeling about that? And I guess, how do you think about that strategy, Eric, trying to take the idea of a guy who's going to benefit if we get an injury item that we don't currently have? I love it. I mean, I think that that's kind of the key to this. There is late swap. So you're able to swap uh, even at 730 when everything locks, you're able to to plug in a prop. So in case anybody gets scratched or in case anything happens there, there should be a prop that you're able to pivot onto. As long as there's a game going on, there's always more than one player listed within it. So you're never going to be taking a zero so long as so nobody, like if it's late scratch, like if they start the game and they get ruled out, you're still going to win on that prop. But uh, if they if they get ruled out beforehand, you got to be able to get onto somebody else. Uh, but Aaron Gordon, uh, already looking great on the over. I'm glad people are starting to come around to him and Alex's projections are coming around to him because I was a big fan of Aaron Gordon uh, starting to take over some of this some of this offense going forward. I knew it was probably not a great thing for Jokic, but I specifically wanted to, I, I've been over the field on Gordon pretty much every single outing here since about, well, since he got there day one. I thought that he was kind of the guy that could randomly spike some upside. We've now seen it back-to-back games. I think it continues here and especially if Jamal Murray comes off the floor. Yeah, I think it gets a lot easier if Jamal Murray is off the floor. It's not a bad prop right now. And I think that's sort of something that, that Eric's talked about before, too. We're playing a guy who just looks okay now, but could potentially look a lot better or allow you to swap on a DK or FanDuel slate later on. I think that's sort of what this is on No House Advantage. Right now, it's got a 71% chance of hitting. If Jamal Murray's out, probably gets, to, again, 85, 90% chance of hitting. And that's sort of a, a prop that gets more valuable. So I think for me, uh, putting that in a, as a mid-tier play right now looks good and could be a lot better by the time that game goes off. Um, I don't know if you're seeing this in YouTube chat, but Jim Beam in chat saying, can you talk MLB, please? Thanks. I play M- MLB, not NBA. Um, I, sure. I think it's funny that his name is Jim Beam because perhaps he just had a little too much of that in the middle of a day, but, um, or in the evening, I guess, if you're on the East coast, but, um, MLB, we have lots of quality shows on there. Live before lock show is still available for you, uh, earlier in the day. And, um, I don't think I even have my MLB sheet today, so I can't, I can't even pretend oh. to give you good picks right now. Why don't you just play Coors? How about that? <laughs> you could just, <laughs> is, there's is a Coors, Coors even on the slate? Even though, you know? yeah, no, no, there's a Coors, Coors slate. Wind's blowing in a little bit there, but, uh, there's thin air and it's Coors <laughs> field. So why not? Uh, that's, that seems like the chalk. I'm happy to, to let that be known. I do like going to you Darvish today too. If you want to talk a little MLB, uh, we saw him get up to 93 pitches last time Man out. Maybe people. very happy to see right out of the gate. Uh, if you're looking for a late slate pitcher which will be happening afterwards here if you played a bunch of like i had a like a handful in the four dollar i couldn't help myself today uh while we were on the nba show but uh but i was yeah. getting requests in chat the super monkey asking and eric would actually love to have this talk pga uh eric oh, give yeah. your masters take yeah so fast. i'm on live before lock for pga tomorrow so for the guy who hates my voice from earlier i'm sorry you can come listen to me talk <laughs> the masters tomorrow we are we're sporting the masters here it's a masters polo every single day of the week best golf week of the entire year as a golfer myself oh and my master's blanket over here which nobody's ever pointed out before but uh it's it's definitely my master's blanket that's here in the guest room so a nice little addition for this week uh looking at colin morikawa is kind of my outright winner this week if you're looking for somebody spieth is going to be crazy crazy high owned i just don't believe in it good lord of christ are we done talking golf now okay. uh no and like lamp wants us to talk league of legends or kbo please and mark of all wants us to talk mma and he asked if we're excited to see okay. Demetrius johnson and eddie alvarez's debut in one tomorrow on TNT. I'm more excited to see Mike Tyson's return to AEW live in front of fans for the first time. <laughs> yeah, so let's pull up let's pull up the League of Legends slate if you really want to go there. I play every <laughs> single sport, so I, I don't really know what you want from me. If you're going to throw the question, an Oswald Plus membership. You're going to throw it in there. Jackie Love uh, continually kind of the guy, the AD carry that you really want to have carry your team in League of Legends. 
Uh, I've been playing him a lot up in the captain slots. It's been working out pretty darn well uh, over the course of the last year when we've been thrust into it. But specifically last time out, uh, the guy went for 21 kills, 35 assists. Absolutely loved it. 166.2 fantasy points. That works. So I like going to him against EDG. I like Lamb saying Jackie Love the Goat. I haven't played um, any Jackie League of Legends since the beginning of 14. Goat. Jackie Love was a monster. I love Jackie Love. I was staying up to so like good. 3 a.m. to watch those games and <laughs> so, go like So Jackie. even before the pandemic, I went to Staples Center. They had the the World Championships. My little brother loves League of Legends. He's a, He's got two little girls, but he sits down in his basement, plays video games till like one in the morning sometimes. He's just he's just the absolute best. But uh, but he uh, he loves his League of Legends. And so a couple of years ago, I, I had no idea what it was. And we went to go watch them at Staples Center. It was an absolute blast. It completely packed, sold out crowd at Staples. Couldn't believe the people watching. Maybe the greatest experience of people watching in my life. It's like Venice on crack. I don't even, I, don't, I shouldn't even read the same out loud, but yeah, I'm sure no house of Angel love it. The Matt Geitz babysitter service saying, can we talk air yards? I'm looking to get hammered. I, you know, I'm ready for some air yards <laughs> talk. Uh, Justin oh. Fields, my NFL draft pick who has the best air yards numbers and Justin Fields should be, I think the top fantasy rookie QB off the board. So now we've so, covered hang everything. On, hang on, hang on, hang on. So what is this issue with his arm talent considering we just saw a video on NFL.com that they couldn't stop retweeting of him chucking at 65 yards. People are He's talking about him not having a cannon, like the, the big differentiator between him and Josh Allen is arm strength. I mean, nobody really has a stronger arm than Josh Allen coming out of college. It was just a question of accuracy. What mm -hmm. do you like so much about Justin Fields? Uh, so so just fantasy wise, I pulled PFS data for him and would just look through it. It was like, this is, if this guy had these numbers in the NFL, he would be somebody I would play every single week where his, he had the most deep throws in the league. He had the most yards that were just air yards. So they weren't created by yards after catch, which is a big thing in college where a guy like Mac Jones, maybe he'll be good in the pros, but mostly a system QB at Bama and just a guy who kind of led guys in the spots who then ran for good yardage. But Justin Fields, it was all him doing everything. And I think he's getting nickel and dime now. People saying he's lazy and doesn't show up to work or whatever. Or doesn't, oh. doesn't stay out. He's like the last guy in first guy to leave and if he's that good i don't care he could be the last guy in. he could be josh allen immediately so i'm i'm very excited for justin fields um <laughs> right, that's fair let's let's keep going and rin pack pointing out i am the president of the josh allen fan club that is correct i've been on him since day one and one of my earliest claims to fame back in josh allen and people used to laugh just like they laugh at my justin fields sakes now um anybody else for no house advantage eric that jump out to you as a play kind of like we talked about with aaron gordon where if things break their way they could get a lot better or they could get i guess a lot worse if somebody's rolled in or ruled out uh i i don't know about reacting to news anywhere else i mean what is Jokic's props sitting at i mean he's basically got 50 50s everywhere his assist is on the lower end if you get jamal murray in maybe taking the under there is probably the the right way to go alex projects him out for 7.27 assists right now 8.5 is the line but i would think uh, the points and rebounds together at 32 and a half, I would probably maybe look at making that a lower confidence over should you get Jamal Murray news, but kind of looking at up and down the rest of this. I mean, we're seeing uh, a lot of low lines on Golden State Warriors. I want to point that out. Kelly Oubre points and assists 16 and a half. Alex has 19.33, 70% over over odds there. I like getting to a couple of these guys. We're seeing some lower stuff on Andrew Wiggins as well. So I'm I'm kind of stacking that entire game in my lineup that I'm making right now as we're talking and just putting in a bunch of Golden State Warriors and hoping that it shoots out. Uh, here's a question here from Ryan Stubbs asking Barton if Murray is out. Um, I don't, let me see if NHA has any Barton props, but we can talk about it holistically too, but I just want to try to align it here with what we're talking about for NHA. I do think Barton's assist prop would get a little more appealing. Um, only two and a half assist line already has a 58% chance of hitting the over. Um, Barton to me is a guy who gains immediately. I, I think that Aaron Gordon does make it a little bit dicier than it used to be for Barton where, um, he does just get more point guard duties. Normally you're going to see Aaron Gordon probably take a good portion of those away, but I think that will Barton. Um, to me, becomes more viable on regular DFS sites and on a no house advantage too. His line two and a half, where it doesn't seem like we're gonna get the Jamal Murray news now, but that's another line that looks playable now, and I think would be really good if Murray ended up rolled out. Yeah, agreed with that. That's a that is the correct way of looking at that. I, I like Barton in a lot of ways. I, I I don't know. His price is a little high for DFS, but that's that's one of the great things about NHA as well is that you can just be basically utilize one piece of the player and be able to capitalize on it. You're not you're not trying to factor in his entire fantasy portfolio. We just want him to pass the ball. Like that seems like an all right spot to be taking a taking a stand with no point guard out there. No no Jamal Murray let it be known who's not the most willing of passers on planet Earth, but uh yeah, Will Barton would definitely have the ball in his hand more. 
Yeah, some other players that know has advantage that seemingly are going to be benefiting from guys being out. Dennis Schroeder's numbers across the board seem to be a little bit better than they would be normally. His rebounds number in particular, I guess, all taking a pretty big jump upwards. Uh, you have no Drummond in there, none of the other Lakers stars, the ADs and LeBrons of the world. So that uh, does open up some more rebound opportunity. And Schroeder's line is three and a half. Uh, Schroeder, not another great rebound guy, but it does seem like, honestly, maybe take Kyle Kuzma's points and rebounds instead of just straight rebounds. It takes Schroeder's regular rebounds prop, I think would be not a bad strategy to capture some of the Lakers' uh, belief that I have tonight and just a lot of opportunity opening up for them uh, with some of the guys that they're going to have out. Uh, let's see. CJ McCollum's three-pointers prop is coming up a lot. Yeah, I'm looking at that. 70% chance of hitting the over on three and a half. I... <laughs> I don't know if I have the. I, I mean, I, I have to have confidence in it because Osmo does, but like I, I didn't think of that one. But that might be another one with McCollum that I think would just go overlooked. Nope, you're defying the boss. I'm writing a report at <laughs> the end of the show. Don't let him know. I'm sure Letting he never watches the show. Oh yeah, no, Spags. He's uh, he's just basically saying he's smarter than you. That's exactly what he said <laughs> verbatim. Uh, let it be known. I I like I like CJ McCollum over there. Three and a half. He's just got a crazy amount of usage right out of the gate, playing gigantic minutes, a game that's fast paced, uh, you know, one of the two highest totals on the board there uh, tonight. I like going there. Yeah, I I think that McCollum, I have projected a three and a half uh, three pointer. So I have him right at the line. So I guess maybe no house advantage. If you want to use my projections, let me know. I can help you out. But I think that I'm on the same page with that being the line. So if Osmo thinks it's an over, I will certainly shade the over there. Uh, I wouldn't have full confidence because I am just at the median projection there with uh, which is exactly the line. But I do think that's one that uh, feels to me like a, a four or five pointer as well. Um, some of the Apple lineups here, I'm also just going to read out an Apple lineup, but you can go to the Apple mm-hmm. lineups page, but I'm just going to read it out for you guys. Now, in case you are the laziest human being alive and can't even go to click the link on the, the top of the Osmo.com site, <laughs> I'm going to give you guys a lineup right now because there are still 149 uh, spots left to fill in their 10 K slam dunk with five K to first place. And that is uh, a spot that you need to get into right now, because if there's any overlay or even decreased rake. That is a big benefit to you as a DFS player. And as somebody too, who has really good data for no house advantage at your fingertips so uh, just don't be lazy and not do it for that reason because that's uh, something that i think some of us as hosts fall in the trap of too where we're busy it's hard to do these shows but guys keep winning on these uh, money on all the sites that we keep having as sponsors because people aren't playing there enough the top lineup for osmo the optimal lineups page uh, which again is part of that top tab uh, under the nba category clint capella is a 10 pointer kendrick nunn is points and assists under is the nine pointer eight pointer damian lillard's assists under seven pointer tyler heroes points and rebounds assists under that's another one where that line was made probably for life that old depot uh steven adams rebounds under 10 and a half that's a six pointer robert covington 10 and a half points under that's the five pointer kemba walker under five and a half assists is a four pointer Aaron Gordon, the over on points and rebounds is a three pointer. The one that we talked about earlier could get better. Uh, if we do see Jamal Murray out Jeremy grants, the two pointer with his points and assists and rebounds under 28 and a half. And the one pointer Marcus smart, three pointers, two and a half under. Um, so maybe one way to get different too, if you played Marcus smart on other sites, but that is the most optimal lineup. It looks like from Osmo today. So just use that one or use any of them on the lineups page. And if you're putting in a bunch of lineups, just, Honestly, just paste all these in into their Excel spreadsheet format, the CSV upload they have on there on the left bar, or just grab the second one on there. And you'll probably be different from a lot of people in the field. Lots of ways to make money on no house advantage. Um, Eric, I see you're doing some lineups, but I'll ask you real fast. Are there any like non-starters for you in no house advantage today? Any guys that you'd feel like the props overall look either overvalued, undervalued, or somewhere in between? Yeah. So, okay. This is, this is kind of the strategy. So I'm going to read off the lineup that I have here today. Uh, Cause again, I, I love playing over here. It's a, it's a great site. Just got in the $20 Kendrick Nunn uh, at the top spot. So I will push back a tiny bit. I think Kendrick Nunn is more of a lock even than Clint Capella. So you could just flip flop those two uh, from the 10 to the nine. Uh, Kendrick Nunn's just not going to see the floor. Kyle Kuzma, I have at the nine spot uh, for the over of the five and a half rebounds. Clint Capella under of 16 and a half is my eight point. Duncan Robinson, I ended up going with the two and a half rebounds. I think talking through that one really helped. Kelly Oubre, 16 and a half points plus assists. It's only one assist extra from his 15 and a half points number. I thought that that was pretty fascinating to be looking that direction. Andrew Wiggins, I talked about putting some of these Golden State guys together. Uh, so 19 and a half points and assists there as well. Uh, 19 and a half is 
probably too low in general. And again, it's just like a one or two point difference of assists. Not that he's going to garner a ton of them, but he averages more than one. Uh, Dennis Schroeder sitting there at three and a half the, over those rebounds. Aaron Gordon, I might try to move up the board based on what this news ends up being. So I can flip flop him and Ubre in that six spot. So I can go Aaron Gordon, who's right now in my three confident spot, the over of 12 and a half points. CJ McCollum, I have the over of that three and a half three pointers made, but you're a little bit hairier on that's I, I'm not hairy on it, but I, I like him at, at that number in my second confidence point slot. And then to make sure I don't give out a full lineup, we'll remove that number one point <laughs> slot. But there are a number of ways and avenues that you can go uh, on NHA uh, for that bottom spot. I kind of tend to uh, find a way to flip flop. Um, like if somebody's going to be very popular, like not necessarily the Kyle Kuzma over, which is a gigantic number uh, for, that Alex has for the 10 and a half there, Kendrick Nunn, uh, definite and under for me, but like bet- between the seven and six confidence point slot, I'm going to flip around Aaron Gordon. Uh, should Aaron Gordon get no Jamal Murray there? And I think that that's kind of an edge that you can have uh, because those props will change and people won't go in. They'll be worried about their DraftKings lineups or their FanDuel lineups. Go in there, flip-flop those around, and you'll have an edge. So react to the news just like you always do, and uh, you'll find a lot more success on NA- on NHA. Yeah, it's only 75% full with about two minutes left or probably less than that by the time you guys hear it. So just plug a lineup in, use that optimal lineups page, which um, put in the chat one more time for you guys in case you want to take it uh, for yourselves. But it's honestly just a smart move to play on some sites like NHA. Um, uh, Jonathan White asking you to NHL, what typically is a necessary score to win decent money? Six to seven points. It's uh, you put a 10 pointer in. So it's like a 10 pointer, a nine pointer, an eight pointer, a seven pointer, a six pointer. Um, The numbers vary in some of the tournaments I've done. So I can't Mm -hmm. really speak to that part but it's definitely more than six or seven points. You're probably going to have to get like nine, eight or nine out of 10, mm-hmm. right? So in golf, well, also uh, it matters a lot more to get your top confidence ones, right? Let that yeah. be known too. In golf, uh, they do a lot of Thursday stuff. Uh, I, I hope that they have a product out for the masters. Let me take a look. If not, I'll make sure that uh, somebody gets on that because I, I didn't see. Yeah, they do. They yep, have a 5k right tournament with two oh, first. I will absolutely be in that because there's a number of ways that you can build lineups uh, for that Thursday tournament. Uh, where you're probably going to have to be perfect because you'll be splitting up top. It's a little bit easier in the golf product to go 100% because some of these uh, outside of the Kuzma Capella props, I mean, you're looking at things that are closer to like one of them is probably going to bust in the number of it, but you hope that the bust is in the one or two confidence point slots uh, because you don't have to always be perfect. Sometimes I've, I've had a couple times where somebody got all 10, right. But uh, I think that that's less uh, prevalent in NBA as opposed to the golf product that they have. Uh, but I, I think if you go for about, I don't know if you can miss two, but they better be in like the one, two or three confidence point slots. And it uh, looks like we are about locked in no house advantage, but I just want to make sure that we uh, give you guys a f- an accurate reporting here where uh, this, they had 10 K guaranteed in the NBA slam dunk today with five K to first. It looks like they're only going to get about 422 to 430 people in here for a few more file in last minute. Um, so that means that they only took in eight, $8,440, which means that uh, they're basically putting in $1,600 of their own money to a prize pool that you don't have to pay that. Like that's sort of the advantage of overlay that we talk about a lot on the various shows on here. So play at no house advantage every day download no house advantage on your various app stores and then when you do that make sure to use the promo code awesome when you sign up because they'll deposit match you up to 20 dollars immediately if you are signing up on there with the promo code awesome let's go nohouseadvantage.com download no house advantage in the app store we thank them very much for putting on the show and if you enjoy these shows too um a you should just be playing a no house advantage for your own pocketbook your own wallet your own uh, e-wallet i don't know i'm not, now i'm just going a full old man here your own your own bitcoin box or whatever you're doing but uh, but no, play on there. And, and also, it helps us out here if you do it too. But really a win-win for everybody involved if you play at No House Advantage. Eric, give them the final plugs here that people should know by now to follow you at Eric Lindquist. But where else can they see you coming up? Uh, there's this terrible DFS player named Rinpak that I do the Slate Starter podcast with every single night. He's awful. He never wins anything. Uh, he only won like, what, 150K this weekend? Whatever. Uh, so I do that with him every single night. Uh, check us out uh, on on the evenings uh, into the mornings. Get your process going for NBA. Uh, we'll be doing some MLB slate, uh, some MLB live before locks here coming up. But big time tomorrow, uh, getting ready for the Masters. I'll be on with Alex Baker and Ben Rasa, the Doctor Ben Rasa, as you have donned him. Uh, we'll be talking about everything Masters leading up. Uh, anything that you guys have, jump in there, ask questions. Best golf week of the entire year. 
Yeah, and follow me at Chris Spags. Follow at Osborne underscore com and check me out tomorrow. I'll be doing bright and early the MLB strategy show with our pal Greg Ehrenberg. 8 a.m. my time, 11 a.m. East Coast time. So tune into that. And the tip off tomorrow, me and Eric get to reunite one more time with our mutual friend Kayla, who we we tolerate. You know, she's okay, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> we'll be back with her tomorrow, though. We, know, we always enjoy Kayla. Great for your guys' enjoyment of that show and for ours. We'll see you guys again soon. Enjoy your nights. Good luck. <laughs>